Hello friends, this is Infinite Paradox Fanfic. How are you all? So we are back with an amazing movie on what if Deku had the six eyes power and limitless. Deku had the power of Gojo Satoru. We all know about the story of Izuku being quirkless and being gifted with OFA by All Might. But what if Izuku was not quirkless? What if Izuku was born with one of the most broken abilities in the history of shonen manga? This is the story where Izuku is born with the powers of Satoru Gojo, the strongest jujutsu sorcerer. How would this change the world of quirks? Watch full to find out. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe and like this video. And if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. It is not clear when it began but people speculate it has been nearly two centuries since that day. The day when the whole world was taken aback by the news of the birth of a mysterious luminous baby in a city in China. The news had been circulated throughout the world and scientists and researchers from all over the world began researching in this peculiar phenomenon that had suddenly occurred in the world. After several experiments were done from the samples taken from the baby, scientists found a peculiar strand of DNA that had been present in the cellular structure of the baby. Studying it further, scientists were able to discover that the origination of this phenomenon was due to that DNA strand. Soon after, several cases of people unlocking weird abilities began making headlines and were constantly being reported from various parts of the world. There were people who could create ice blocks to cover their hand, people who could move objects telepathically and other weird things. Scientists began researching further in this new phenomenon and surely, each of these people had that unique strand which was traced as the origin of all these weird abilities. But as time progressed, things which were extraordinary became ordinary. And these new abilities were given the name of, quirks. However, these abilities opened up the gates for newer possibilities. Dreams became a reality. And soon enough, movies became real. With the emergence of quirks, the order and law enforced by the governments of the world began falling. There was a sudden increase in the number of criminals who were termed as villains. In order to deal with this new threat, governments all around the world decided to form their own group of people. A group which would combat these villains to maintain order and peace. A group which would work to deliver justice to all those who were wronged. A group of heroes. From that group, emerged many who were considered as the epitome of the hero society. However, amongst all of them stood one person who became the symbol of peace. He was none other than All Might, but this isn't his story. It is the story of Izuku Midoriya. The boy who became a god in the world of heroes. Don't do this Kachan, a green-haired boy said shakily as he stood in front of another boy protectively. What the hell Deku? A spiky blonde-haired boy yelled angrily, get out of my way. I I can't do that Kachan. I can't let you bully him like that. The green-haired boy said as he stood in front of the boy. The boy could feel himself shake but stood his ground. Oi Deku. Are you really going to take the beating for him? One of the two lackeys that followed Bakugo around asked smugly. Why yes. Be because that is what a hero would do. The green-haired boy said. He glanced around the park and his heart pounded even faster when he realized there was no adult there. The spiky blonde, Bakugo, growled in anger. Oi you shitty nerd, are you still going on about being a hero? Small sparks started emerging from his hands. Deku gulped in fear but held his ground. Yes. I want to be a hero. Bakugo began laughing mockingly. As if a quirkless nobody like you would ever become a hero. The blonde then glanced at the greenette and smirked. Look behind you, Deku. That boy you wanted to save has already run away. Izuku turned his head and indeed found that the boy had run away. He turned his head to look at Bakugo who was smirking menacingly at him. Maybe you need a little reminder of your place, shitty Deku. The blonde growled as small explosions went off in his hands. The green-haired boy closed his eyes and prepared himself for the attack, it wasn't something new to him. After all, this was what happened all the time. Every time Bakugo and his lackeys would beat him or bully him, the teachers would just turn a blind eye to that. As if what was happening, did not concern them in any way. As if Izuku was not their responsibility. If the teachers did not stop Bakugo, then what could he expect from an empty park? He knew no one was coming to save him, no hero no teacher, no adult. This time too, he would go home with all these injuries and pretend that he had fallen or tripped, just so that his mother would not worry. And so, the green-haired little boy waited with his eyes closed for the pain of being burnt. 
He waited. And waited. And waited a little more. But nothing happened. He did not feel any pain. Had he grown accustomed to the pain? He did not doubt that. After all, after taking as many mini explosions as he had, it was only right that he would build some sort of pain tolerance. What the hell Deku? Izuku flinched, hearing Bakugo shout like that. He opened his eyes and saw Bakugo glaring at him as if trying to burn him alive. Why the hell can't I touch you? Bakugo yelled his question. W what? Izuku muttered meekly. Bakugo gritted his teeth, as more explosions went off in his hands. He ran at Izuku, his palm drawing close to Izuku's face. But, Izuku was frozen in fear. This was the first time Bakugo had gone for his head. Was Bakugo really trying to kill him? Time slowed down for Izuku. As Bakugo's hands drew close, for some reason, Izuku could see some form of energy around Bakugo's hand. The energy was expanding volatilely, as if waiting to explode. And then suddenly, his perception increased. Out of nowhere, he became aware of everything and anything in his surroundings. In that minuscule period of time, he became aware of everything within that park. He could see the bird perched on a distant tree, the swing in the opposite direction of his vision. He did not understand what was happening, but knew that, if he did not do anything, Bakugo would forever scar his face. So, he wished with every fiber of his being for something to protect him, for something to save him. And his wish was granted. As Bakugo got close enough to Izuku's face, he let out a small explosion powerful enough to break a child-sized rock. But to the amazement of Izuku and absolute shock of Bakugo and his lackeys, the explosion stopped inches before Izuku's face and parted in two different ways. It was as if a barrier of some sort had been erected before Izuku's face. Bakugo's face turned into a vicious snarl. What the hell Deku? Just stand down and take the beating, you bastard. He tried sending another explosion, this time aimed at Izuku's chest but found that he could not get near him. Even then he let the explosion go off, and once again found that the explosion could not even reach him. Izuku then felt a presence enter his range. He could sense, no, see that the figure was a male and had some sort of weird particles in his eyes, which seemed to be dry and devoid of sleep. While Izuku was busy trying to understand how he felt the man enter his range, Bakugo was trying his very best to get his hands on Izuku. Realizing that his explosions were not going to work, he roared as animalistically as a child could, and sent a punch at Deku's chest. But his eyes widened, when he realized that his hands had stopped inches away from Izuku. He tried to move his hand further, but unfortunately, he could not. And the most interesting thing was. He did not feel any form of barrier between his hand and Izuku. It was as if he just could not touch Izuku. His hands just refused to go near him. He gritted his teeth. His eyes moved upwards and met Izuku's eyes. And for the third time that day, his eyes widened in shock. Because staring right back at him weren't the green eyes that he had become so accustomed to. The green eyes that held fear in them. Instead, a pair of green eyes that shone like emeralds stared back at him. These eyes were different. These eyes had a certain glow in them that did not fit well with him. These eyes seemed to pierce right through him, gazing at his soul and judging him. There was something wrong with Izuku's eyes and Bakugo did not like it. Hey, what are you kids doing? A deep voice from the entrance of the park said. As if the weird space between him and Izuku disappeared, Bakugo immediately drew his arms back and took off in the opposite direction. He did not want to face whoever it was that had spoken. He had things to sort out first. As for Izuku, he glanced towards the entrance of the park. A man with dark hair and bandages loosely wrapped around his shoulder was walking towards him. As if all energy was drained from him, Izuku's eyes drooped as he fell backwards, but instead of falling on hard ground, he fell on something comforting. Something warm. Trying to snuggle as close to the warmth as possible, Izuku closed his eyes and fell unconscious. As Izuku laid there, his mind drifted towards a distant memory he had all but forgotten. Flashback. Midoriya Izuku was a bright and happy four-year-old boy with a dream of becoming a hero. He had dark green hair and bright green eyes. He was a giddy and excited boy whose eyes shone with a brightness that none had ever seen. Izuku was currently sitting at the doctor's office with his mother, Midoriya Inko, sitting beside him. Inko was a beautiful lady with green hair and a curvaceous body that would make most women her age jealous. However, currently she was feeling something she had not felt in a long time, apprehension. 
Izuku, however, was completely unaware of his mother's tension. Why? Because he was too much excited to care about his surroundings. Today was his fourth birthday and by this time everyone would unlock their quirks. So, Izuku was brought to the hospital by his mother for a checkup so that they could determine what Izuku's quirk was. Mom, do you think I will have an awesome quirk? Izuku asked his mother with an excited grin. Inko gave Izuku a strained smile, which went completely unnoticed by the child. Of course, honey. I am sure you will be amazing. Izuku began bouncing in his chair even more excited while Inko felt her shoulders become heavy due to guilt. Suddenly, she heard the door to the office open and the doctor walk in with a grim expression on his face. And this only increased Inko's worry for her son. The doctor did not glance at the mother-son duo and sat down in his sit opposite to them, all the while eyeing the stack of paper in his hands. He then put the papers on his table and sighed. D doctor, is everything all right? Inko asked, with worry evident in her voice. Hey doctor, can you tell me what my quirk is? Izuku asked, excitement flashing in his eyes. Is it something amazing like that of all mites? The doctor frowned and rubbed his forehead. I don't know what to really say. Izuku's smile dropped slightly as the doctor paused. Even though he was a child, he could sense the hesitation in the doctor's voice. The doctor sighed and continued. I mean, young Midoriya, here has every sign of him having a quirk. But for some reason, it has yet to activate like normal. Izuku's smile dropped completely this time. B but, Izuku tried to argue but nothing came out of his mouth. D doctor, D does that mean he can still awaken his quirk? I mean everyone his age has already awakened their quirks. Inko pleaded in desperation. The doctor nodded his head. Well, he should be able to awaken his quirk. He then pulled out an x-ray sheet and displayed it to the duo. You see this? This is the x-ray of your son's feet. He then pointed at the pinky toe. Like you know, most people with quirks, have only one joint in their pinky toe. Your son too possesses one joint. That should mean that he has a quirk. From the looks of it, his quirk is still dormant. It won't be the first time something like this happened. Maybe his quirk needs some form of trigger to awaken. Izuku stared at the doctor wide-eyed. His whole body was currently shaking. D does T that mean I can S still be a hero? He managed to ask shakily. Yes, kid. The doctor replied with a comforting smile. You just need to wait for your quirk to awaken. Izuku could no longer keep it in and the tears started flowing out of his eyes. Inko nodded her head gratefully at the doctor. She picked her son up as he buried his head in the crook of her neck, crying. His hands gripped her blouse tightly. She thanked the doctor before she left the room. As the mother-son duo reached home, Inko put her son down. She hated to look at her son so down. She did not remember when she had seen him this disappointed last. Izuku dear, why don't you go and wash yourself? I will go and prepare your favorite dish, Inko said softly. Izuku did not say anything, he only nodded and headed towards the bathroom. Dinner was a quite affair. Inko's heart broke even more seeing Izuku eat like a robot. She had prepared his favorite dish, something which had been able to cheer him up every time. But today, even that did not seem to work. After finishing his dinner, Izuku carried his dishes and put them in the basin like he always did. He softly said good night to his mother and trudged towards his room. After washing the dishes, Inko was about to head towards her room when she heard voices from Izuku's room. She walked towards his room's door and opened it as slowly as possible. And the sight that greeted her, filled her eyes with tears. Izuku was sitting in front of his computer watching videos of All Might. He turned slowly, most probably noticing his mother due to the monitor's reflection. M mom. See can I be a hero? Izuku's voice was shaky as he said. See can I be L like All Might? Inko tried. She tried her best to control her tears. She wanted to tell Izuku that he could be a hero. A great hero. But she also knew the kind of life a hero led and how dangerous that was. As a mother, she could never urge her child towards danger. So, she did the only thing she could do. She ran towards her child and hugged him, as tears poured down her eyes. Yes. Yes. You can, Izuku. You can. Flashback end. Izuku's eyes fluttered open and he immediately closed them back due to the rays of sun invading his eyes. He raised an arm to block the sun rays and pushed his body up with his other arm so that he could sit up. He looked around and found that he was lying on one of the park benches. Ah. Seems like you're finally awake. 
Took you long enough. A voice said in a dry tone. Izuku looked towards where the voice had spoken and found a man sitting by his feet sipping a juice box. The man had long, black shaggy hair. He had bandages loosely wrapped around his neck. He wore dark clothes. Izuku flinched as the man turned his head towards him. His eyes were red and had dark circles under them. Looked like the man had not slept for quite some time now. My name is Aizawa Shoda. The man introduced in an uninterested tone. Want to tell me what was going on back there? Izuku fidgeted in his place. T thanks for looking after me, he said, and I don't know what you are talking about. Izuku turned his gaze sideways when he noticed the man's gaze boring on him, as if the man was scrutinizing him. You know, I am a hero, Aizawa stated. You should not be lying to me. You, you're a hero? Izuku asked meekly. I, I have never heard of you. Understandable, Aizawa said. I never really was one for publicity. Oh oh, now, are you going to tell me what was going on? K. Kachan and I W were just playing, Izuku finished, not looking at the man at once. Aizawa stared at the boy with narrowed eyes. He had seen a small interaction of the kid with the blonde one. And from what he could gather from that small interaction, they were far from playing. As much as he wanted to help, if the kid did not say anything to him, then there was little he could do. He released a sigh. All right, let's bring you home, he said standing up. Izuku nodded and jumped off the bench and took his position beside the man as they walked towards his home. While they walked, Aizawa glanced at the kid from the corner of his eye. He had noticed that back in the park, the kid had obviously used his quirk. From his observation, it seemed like some sort of barrier quirk, which were pretty rare in the world. Though, he had a feeling that there was something more to the kid's quirk, than what met the eyes. As he contemplated, he noticed that the kid was fidgeting. He knew the sign all too well. The kid wanted to ask questions but could not find the courage to do it. Do you want to ask something? Aizawa stated in a bored tone. Go on then. I, uh, I, you said you were a hero, right? Izuku asked in a small voice. What is your hero name? I don't think you will know about me, but I go by the name Eraserhead. Wait. You are Eraserhead? Izuku yelled, his eyes shining with awe and fascination. Aizawa looked at the kid who just by hearing his name had lit up like a Christmas tree. You know me, kid? Of course, I know you. You are the underground hero, Eraserhead. The hero who works in the dark and has owned the shadows like no one else. You are like Batman just without the money. Izuku finished excitedly. Aizawa was impressed. For a five-year-old kid to know about underground heroes was something else. Impressive. You must be a fanboy then. Izuku laughed sheepishly. Yeah. I mean I like to learn about heroes. You must be aiming to be a hero then. Aizawa asked as he glanced at Izuku from the corner of his eyes. Izuku's enthusiastic smile dropped into a melancholic one. Yeah. I do want to become a hero. But I don't know how I can be a hero without a quirk. Aizawa blinked. What are you talking about? Did not you use your quirk back there at the park? Izuku's eyes widened slowly in realization. Oh my god. I completely forgot about that. He cried out holding his head with his hands. Aizawa released a tired sigh. You do realize that using your quirk in public is strictly prohibited by the law. I I know. Izuku stuttered. B but I did not have a quirk before today. Aizawa stared at the boy to his right. How old are you? Five. Interesting. So, you mean, you awoke your quirk today? Why yeah. I see. A late bloomer then, huh? Soon, the two found themselves in front of an apartment complex. Aizawa noted that the neighborhood was interestingly calm and nice. Maybe I can find an apartment here, he mused to himself. Aizawa followed Izuku to the third floor and then to a door. Izuku knocked and a few seconds later, a woman in her late twenties opened the door. She sported the same green hair as the kid, though it was much straighter than her son's, and Aizawa would never say it loud but he found the woman exceptionally beautiful. Izuku, you're home. The woman said with a smile before her eyes landed on him, her smile never fading, and you have brought a guest. Yeah. Mom this is the underground hero I was talking about yesterday, he is a racerhead, Izuku exclaimed excitedly. Oh my, how can I help you, Mr. Eraserhead, Inko asked bowing slightly. Aizawa shook his head and continued in his monotone. No, no it's all right. 
I found him unconscious in the park and looked after him. Inko bowed gratefully. Thank you, Mr. Eraserhead. I am extremely grateful. Aizawa looked at Izuku who was vibrating in excitement and then looked at Inko who seemed to get his message. Mom, mom. I awakened my quirk today. Izuku said bouncing in joy. That's great Izuku-chan. Why don't you go inside and wash your hands? We will go you to the doctor after we eat lunch. Okay. With that Izuku ran inside. Quite the hyperactive child you have there. Aizawa commented to which Inko simply smiled. I can't deny that. He has always been quite active and cheerful. Aizawa nodded absent-mindedly. Say, do you know of someone named Kachan? Inko blinked a little taken aback by that question. Kachan? You mean Katsuki? Why? So, you do know. Can you tell me where his house is? Um. Yes, I do know where his house is, but why do you want to know that? Aizawa stared at her blankly for a few seconds before saying, I saw him using his quirk in the park. I need to talk to his parents. Using one's quirk in public is supposed to be prohibited. Oh oh. I hope he is not in trouble. What would you say if I told you the brat was using his quirk on your child? Aizawa thought before saying, No I would like to issue a warning for now at least. He is a child. But if he does not abide the law, we may have to send him to rehab. Well, he lives down the street. In a yellow house. House number 53, Inko said. Aizawa nodded before turning away. Have a good day, Mrs. Midoriya. You too, Mr. Eraserhead. Three days later, Izuku found himself sitting in his classroom with a big smile on his face. A smile that had not left his face since the beginning of the day. Today was the most special day in Izuku's life. Today was the day the results of his quirk would be declared. And he could not contain himself. The suspense and excitement were eating at his patience. After eating lunch that day, the mother and son duo had found themselves sitting in the same doctor's chamber that they had visited a year ago. The doctor had then led Izuku to a test lab where the other doctors had tried a lot of tests. By the end of the day, none of them had reached a conclusive result that day. Most of the time, quirk results were declared almost immediately and, in some cases, would take a day to be declared. But for some reason, the doctors found it very difficult to conclude what his quirk was. They had been called the next day for more tests and were said that the doctors needed some more tests done. So, the next day they had to visit the hospital again. Finally, the doctors had said that they would declare what his quirk was, the next day. The bell rang throughout the school. The students started packing their bags. Izuku hurriedly put his books in his bag, unable to wait any further. Just as he was about to race out of the classroom, Bakugo appeared in front of him. So, Deku, have you found out what your quirk is? He asked with a sneer on his face. You uh. Not yet, Kachan. But the doctor said I would get the results today. Izuku replied shifting nervously. A. Hey. Bakugo sneered. Did you hear that guys? Deku will get his quirk today. After three days. It looks like your quirk is so pathetic that even the doctors don't want to tell you what your quirk is. Yeah. One of Bakugo's lackeys laughed, as if Deku would ever have a useful quirk. T that's not nice, K Kachan. Izuku stuttered out. Oh. Then what do you want me to say, Deku? Bakugo smiled menacingly. Do you want me to ask what building you jumped off to get a quirk? Izuku flinched at the statement while the lackeys behind Bakugo laughed harder. The blonde boy snorted. I would tell you this Deku, you will never be a hero. With that Bakugo left the room followed by his lackeys. Izuku stood in his place with tears starting to well up in his eyes. The students around him looked at him with pity but none of them said anything. Izuku sniffed and rubbed his eyes furiously. No. I won't cry today. Today is the big day. Izuku thought to himself before running out of the room towards the school main gate. There his mother stood waiting for him. His mother smiled at him before opening the car door to let him in. After that. The mother-son duo drove to the hospital and found themselves sitting in the doctor's chambers. A few minutes later, the doctor came in and sat opposite to them. He laid the files back on the table. He pulled out a handkerchief and wiped his forehead with it. Um, doctor. About the quirk, Inko trailed off as the doctor let out a chuckle. I, I must say Miss Midoriya, young Izuku here is truly a once-in-a-generation case, the doctor said with a nervous chuckle. What do you mean, doctor? Inko asked, hope shining in her eyes. 
Ah, I don't even know where to begin. The doctor let out a sigh, before picking up the file and then shuffling through the documents. I would be honest with you. Last year when you came for the quirk identification and your son's quirk did not awaken, I had assumed that your son's quirk was too weak to show up. D does that mean my quirk is W weak? Izuku asked nervously. Did that mean Kachan was right? Was he really useless? Weak, the doctor chuckled. If your quirk is weak, then every other quirk is just useless. W what do you mean, doctor? Inko asked. The easiest way to explain Izuku's quirk is that he is a living and walking mathematical and scientific paradox. The doctor said rubbing the sweat off his forehead. That's supposed to be easy to understand. Inko deadpanned at the doctor who laughed awkwardly. Uh. I am quite sure you guys have heard about the Zeno paradox or as commonly known as Achilles paradox. The doctor asked. Um, no sir. Inko said shaking her head. Hum. Well it was one of the four paradoxes given by the Greek philosopher Zeno thousands of years ago. It concerns a race between the fleet-footed Achilles, a Greek demigod, and a slow-moving tortoise. In the race, the tortoise is given a few meters head start and then both of them start moving at the same time. But the condition is that Achilles will always have to travel a distance equal to the distance traveled by the tortoise. The argument is that no matter at what speed Achilles moves, he would never be able to overtake the tortoise. This is because, by the time Achilles has reached the position of the tortoise when the race started, the tortoise would have already moved a certain distance. Achilles would now have to travel the same distance as the tortoise, but by the time Achilles has covered that distance, the tortoise would have already moved another distance. With time, Achilles would only grow slower and slower and hence would never be able to overtake the tortoise. It is like every time you divide a number, you would never actually reach zero but would reach infinitesimally close to it. Inko and Izuku sat through the explanation. While Inko understood a little of what the doctor said, everything went above Izuku's head. So, uh, what does that have to do with my son's quirk? Inko asked a little dazed with all the information. Well, you see, your son's quirk is special. Because it abides so closely with Achilles' paradox. In other words, your son's quirk is literally bringing infinity to reality. Infinity, too, reality. Inko muttered slowly. Uh huh. The doctor nodded. At first, even we were a little skeptical with our findings, and that's why we decided to do more tests. Your son's quirk literally makes an imaginary figure like infinity into reality. The barrier that we witnessed was nothing but his quirk dividing the space between him and the object into infinite number of spaces. W. Wow! Inko exclaimed, tears forming in her eyes. I is my quirk strong? Izuku asked, looking between his mother and the doctor. It is probably the strongest quirk ever registered young Izuku, the doctor said with a big smile. Izuku's eyes widened in awe, e even stronger than a all mites. The doctor let out a chuckle. Most likely, if we are to combine the other aspects of your quirk. Wait. There is more to his quirk, Inko asked, thoroughly shocked. Uh huh. Beside this quirk, it seems Izuku also has an ocular quirk, that increases his perception greatly. And from what we can gather from our tests, the doctor took a deep breath. This ocular quirk also allows him to see a person's quirk and when they are going to use it. T that, I, Inko found herself at a loss for words. Yep. We had the same reaction. The doctor said. We don't even have a clear idea what his ocular quirk does. And I believe that we have only scratched the top of the grass. There is a possibility that there are other aspects to his ocular quirk. Your son not only possesses one but two very strong quirks. I, Inko swallowed. She wanted her son to be strong, but at this point it was getting out of hand. But it does not end there. There is more. Inko almost yelled. Ah ha ha. The doctor laughed awkwardly. Yeah, about that. Your son seems to possess a weird energy within his body. The energy is nothing like what we have recorded before. This is a completely new type of energy that is flowing within his body and we believe that this energy is closely related to his other two quirks. My god! Inko muttered as she took deep breaths to calm herself down. Same reaction. The doctor joked with a chuckle. We have decided that Izuku's ability to make infinity into reality should be called, limitless, and his ocular quirk should be called, six eyes, like the sixth sense. So, do you guys like it? Yep. Izuku chirped. They sound super cool and powerful. Yeah, I know that. The doctor replied with a smile. 
Hero Association headquarters. The next day, three individuals were present in a large room showcasing the city of Hone through a large windowed wall. One of the individual was a woman in her late forties with ash blonde hair and had turquoise eyes. She had a stoic and steely expression on her face and was wearing a black jacket suit and dress with a purple shirt. A necklace hung around her neck. She was sitting behind the only desk in the room calmly eyeing the individual standing opposite her. The second individual was a lanky looking middle aged man with beige, chin length, and messy hair. He was dressed in a formal black shirt with a white undershirt, followed with equally black pants. Around his neck was a loose tie and on his feet were black shoes. He was also wearing a microphone. He had noticeable bags under his eyes signifying his lack of sleep. He was standing behind the woman eyeing the individual opposite him curiously. The last individual looked like a human dog hybrid. He was a very tall, sturdily built man with the head of a beagle. The area around his eyes and his ears was a dark brown, the two sides separated by a tan line which runs down his forehead, widening at his muzzle, which was flecked with pale brown. He had a large, black nose and dark eyes, and, although the rest of his body is of normal human shape, his skin appears to be the same tan color as most of his face. He was wearing a suit, consisting of a dress shirt and waistcoat, over which he was wearing an unbuttoned black blazer and matching dress pants underneath. He had a belt with a large buckle and a black and white tie that resembled a Dalmatian's coat. So, what do you have for us Mr. Kenji? The woman sitting behind the desk asked. As I had reported before Miss President, it would seem that the rate of crime has gone up over the last five years compared to the last decade. The President gained a serious look on her face. She had indeed read the reports from the chief of the police force and it did not bode well with her. I see. I have read the reports but are you completely sure about this, chief? The dog-human hybrid nodded his head grimly. I am as serious as I can be Miss President. The crime rate has indeed increased and even with an increase in the number of heroes and police, we are still having trouble to deal with all the crimes all over the country. It was a disturbing thought for the president of the Public Safety Commission to know that even the heroes and police together were having a hard time dealing with all the crime in the country. They had worked hard to establish a semblance of peace in the country after the debacle from five years ago. She had honestly hoped that with the downfall of the mega villain, villain activity would go down, but that seemed like a wishful thought. But unfortunately, that is not the only disturbing thing that we have found. The president of the Public Safety Commission eyed the chief with wary eyes waiting for another bad news, and what would that be Kenji San? The chief of the police force paused for a moment before replying. It would seem that the power of the quirks of the villains have also increased. That made the president go cold. Explain, she uttered in a cold tone as her breath hitched in her throat. Over the last five years, we have documented some simple quirks doing massive devastation. A simple fire quirk was able to destroy a whole skyscraper without any kind of inflammable liquid. A simple water-based quirk was able to draw a hundred hostages trapped in a building. A simple telekinetic quirk which could only move small objects before was able to not only raise a building and throw it at another. The chief paused for a few moments before continuing. Take any instances from the last five years, you would notice that simple quirks are doing much more destruction than they were meant to. Are you sure Kenji San? that it is not caused by some form of quirk enhancing drug the president asked kenji shook his head negatively unfortunately no from the villains we had captured we did an extensive search and examination of their bodies we did find several drugs but none of them were quirk enhancing ones the president looked at her assistant and successor from the corner of her eyes as she waited for more information the amount of death has also increased and it has unsettled the public the public is starting to question the ability of the current heroes to protect them and are also starting to question the government on not taking more serious actions against villains. The president closed her eyes in concentration and went over all the information she had possessed. It was only thanks to her years as the head of the Hero Public Safety Commission, did she maintain a stoic expression. Inwardly however, she was rattled by these revelations. She had been aware that the situation was worsening at a speedy rate but for it to be this bad, she had truly not expected that. Throughout the years of its establishment, the Hero Public Safety Commission had never interfered with hero work, preferring to work from the shadows. But if it continued like this, then they would have no choice but to come into the light and take a proactive stance against villains. But that would also mean that they would become vulnerable and someone could discover all the dirty secrets that the Commission had buried deep over the last decade alone. But all these could come later. 
Right now, they needed to deal with the villains and it would seem that stricter actions were due for the villains. All right, Chief Kenji San. Your report has been taken under consideration. The Hero Public Safety Commission will make contact with the government and find a way to deal with the villains appropriately. You are free to leave. The chief of the police force bowed and left the room leaving the president and her successor alone. The president released a sigh and leaned back in her chair. These truly are troubling times aren't they Yukimaru? Indeed, they are ma'am. The lanky man replied. But on a much lighter note, he said pulling out a file from the suitcase he always carried, I have here the quirk documentation of a kid. Yukimaru handed the file to the president. The president raised an eyebrow in curiosity but did not question the man. She knew the man was pretty serious with his job and would not bring something like this up if he did not see the importance in this. So, she took the file from the man and opened it. The first thing she noticed was the picture attached to the file. It was of a green-haired boy with sliver highlights and crystal green eyes like emerald that seemed to stare at your soul even through the photo. Izuku Midoriya, the president muttered, what's so special about this kid Yukimaru? Please, keep reading the file Miss President, you will know. Reading through the file, she become more and more astonished. What? How is that possible? The president questioned. Yukimaru nodded. Yes. This child's quirks was registered a doctor named Takahara Gekko. According to him, the boy has a quirk that could possibly be the strongest quirk in existence and he is pretty sure of it. For now, the doctors could not make a conclusion as to what the quirk can do but one of the many aspects of his quirk is to bring infinity into reality. The president's eyes were wide with shock. That, how is that even possible? Yukimaru shook his head. No one really knows, but the doctor believes there is more to the boy's quirk than just a simple barrier, and that the barrier was just a tip of the iceberg. The files also say, that he has two other quirks. The president said, a person with two quirks is rare, and this kid has three of them. Yukimaru nodded. Yes. Limitless, six eyes and the weird energy flowing in his body. This child could easily be the key to a more prosperous future. He could take over All Might once when the latter retires. The president thought about it. They had already had a case like it. A boy with an extraordinary quirk whom they had taken under wing and made into a hero. But that time it was almost clear to them that the boy was extraordinary, something she could not conclude for this Midoriya kid. So, she wondered if it was truly worth it to be involved with this boy. Are you sure Yukimaru? Do you really think it would be beneficial if we get involved with this kid? If you ask me, we should take him under our wing. He could be a beneficial member of this commission. Not to mention, with these turbulent times, we need all the resources on hand as quickly as possible. I see, the president released a sigh, all right. Make contact with the Midoriya family and offer them the chance to train. If they accept then good, otherwise we will leave them be. That night, Inko found herself preparing dinner. She had a megawatt smile on her face as her eyes went towards her son playing with the All Might figurine. She could not believe what had happened the other day. Her son had quirks. Not one. Not two. But three quirks. Though none of them were similar to hers or her deadbeat husband's. But each of these quirks were powerful. The ability to bring infinity to reality. The ability to perceive things at an incredible rate and being able to see quirks. The weird energy. All of these seemed too surreal. For a moment she thought that she was just dreaming and that once she woke up tomorrow, none of these would be real. But none of that mattered now. All that mattered was that her son had a quirk, sorry quirks, and now he could strive for his dream. And she would be there beside him always supporting him. Just when she was done making dinner, someone knocked on the door. She dried her hands with a cloth and walked towards the door. Opening it, she was greeted with two men wearing dark suits. The first one was a lanky man with beige, chin length and messy hair. The man seemed to be sleep deprived. The other man had short hair and was wearing dark sunglasses, at night, he carried a briefcase in his hand. Uh, may I help you? Inko asked uncertainly. The lanky looking man took charge as he introduced, good evening ma'am. My name is Yukimaru and this here is my partner Yamamoto. We are from the HPSC, also known as Hero Public Safety Commission and we are here to discuss about your son. May we come in? Oh of course. Inko said letting them in. As the three of them entered the living room, Inko noticed the two men eyeing her son. Izuku why don't you go to your room? Izuku did not protest and simply ran to his room and closed the door. 
Inko glanced at the two men and asked them to take seats. The two men thanked her and sat on the couch while Inko brought them two glasses of water. Thank you for your hospitality, ma'am. Yukimaru said while Yamamoto nodded. Now maybe it is time we discuss about your son. Oh okay. Yukimaru began. Well, your son's quirk was registered with the government the previous day and we must say, he is quite an interesting kid. With not one, not two but three quirks. I, Inko could not find words to say. She should have known something like this would happen. You must have realized by now, that if this became a common knowledge, then not only your son but you two would have big targets on your head. Yukimaru finished with a grave tone. Inko gulped. Her heart was pounding, and it was starting to become difficult to breathe. That's why we have an offer for you. Yukimaru said motioning at his partner who laid the briefcase on the tea table and opened it. Inko's eyes widened looking inside the briefcase. It was filled with stashes of cash. In that briefcase, there is 10 million yen. Enough to last your lifetime. Also, we will let you settle at a bigger place than this and you will be able to live the rest of your life lavishly. All you have to do is, Yukimaru said pulling out a contract and laying it down on the table, sign this contract and hand over Izuku's custody to us. Yukimaru narrowed his eyes as he stared at the green-haired woman in front of him. This won't be the first time that someone had given up their children for money and fortune. And this won't be the last. He expected her to sign the contract and be done with it. But what he had not expected was the explosive reaction of the woman. How? How dare you? Enko roared. Yukimaru and Yamamoto jumped up as all the items in the living room started glowing green and floated towards them, encircling the three of them. The knives and the forks pointing menacingly at them. How dare you come into my home and decide to take Izuku away from me? Inko said menacingly. With each word spoken, the knives would draw closer and closer. Yukimaru looked at the woman. She had fury etched on her face even though her eyes threatened to spill with tears. This was the first time he had witnessed a parent react so violently to the offer. And it filled him with hope that not every parent was greedy in this world. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Yamamoto commented lightly, making Yukimaru chuckle. What's so funny, you bastards? Inko sneered. If you would relax a little. Yukimaru replied. Believe it or not, we have offered the same contract to many parents before and they had all accepted it without a second thought, happy to give up their children for money and fortune. And you expect me to bend over like them? If you thought so, then you would be incredibly wrong. Inko said her rage evident in her voice. Yukimaru chuckled and said, not at all. In fact, we are glad that you did not accept. The children of those parents were all broken from inside after knowing that their parents had given them up for money. And if we want to train the future replacement of All Might to his full extent, then he would obviously need someone to support him along the way. W what? Inko sputtered as the items dropped to the floor. Yukimaru smiled at Inko. Miss Midoriya. Would you allow us to train your son to be the next symbol of peace? Suddenly, the door to Izuku was thrown open as Izuku came running into the living room. Mom. Please accept the offer. Inko looked at Izuku with uncertainty. You don't have to leave him, Miss Midoriya. Yukimaru said once again. You can be by his side while we train him. We won't do anything illegal or unethical. Every day, he would still come home to you. All we will do is train him during the day and afternoon. That's all we require, Miss Midoriya. I I guess, Inko said, still unsure if her decision was right. Though, Yukimaru began, it would be better if you transfer to a better place than this so that we can provide increased protection to you and young Izuku here. Don't worry, the HPSC would bear the cost for everything. Can I become like All Might? Izuku asked as he looked excitedly at the lanky man. Yukimaru smiled and replied, Dear Izuku, you will be even better than him. I am here. I am here. I am here. The voice of the world's strongest hero, the symbol of peace, rang throughout the room. A second later, a hand came out of the blanket lying on the bed beside the table and slammed itself on the clock halting the rhythmic booming voice of All Might. A voice grumbled in disappointed as the blanket was thrown off and a figure climbed out of the bed. The room was fairly big and clean. It had two bookshelves filled to the brim on one side. Adjacent to it was a desktop with two monitors. There was a door that led to the washroom. There was also a TV attached to the wall opposite to the bed. A carpet laid on the floor. 
there was also a cupboard filled with action figures of various heroes directly opposite to the bookshelves. With eyes half closed, the figure walked towards the door beyond which was the personal washroom of the figure. The figure opened the door and walked into the room and soon found himself standing before a basin with a mirror attached to the wall above him. The figure fluttered his eyes open and was greeted with the sight of his reflection staring back at him. The figure had spiky green hair with sliver highlights. He had crystal green eyes that looked like emeralds shining in the sun he had a prominent jawline and little freckles below his eyes. The figure was none other than Izuku Midoriya, who was now 14 years old. He picked up the toothbrush, applied toothpaste to it and brushed his teeth. Once done, he hoped onto the shower and took a long shower. After drying himself, he wrapped a clean towel around his waist and walked out of the room. Standing in front of the full mirror, Izuku admired his physique. He had grown quite a bit in the last decade. He was now 5 feet 7 inches tall, an admirable height for his age. His torso adorned the signs of a budding six packs and his biceps, while not overly beefy, were still muscled enough to give him an athletic figure. He went towards his wardrobe and picked up the school uniform that he was going to wear. It consisted of a white shirt, white pants, blue blazer with silver colored buttons and a blue tie. He picked up the custom made round sunglasses and put them over his eyes. The sunglasses had been specifically designed with darker glasses to accommodate his ocular quirk. Once he was dressed, he picked up his school bag and walked out of his room. He then walked into a larger room that acted as both the dining room and the kitchen. His mother was currently working in the kitchen, most probably cooking his breakfast. Good morning, mom. Izuku greeted cheerfully as always. Good morning, Izu-chan, his mother greeted back, giving him a bright smile. Izuku put the bag down beside his chair at the dining table and smiled. Their lives had changed since the day he had discovered his quirk and the HPSC scouts had come knocking on his door. After the whole debacle of his mother threatening to neuter the two HPSC scouts with blunt, rusty knives if they so much as tried to take him away from her and her threatening to call the police on them, the HPSC members had finally managed to explain the offer to his mom. All the HPSC wanted was to train a future hero prospect who had the most chances of surpassing all might and maintaining the peace in these turbulent times. They explained that with how the situation was worsening day by day, a quirk such as Izuku's could not be let to go to waste. In return, the HPSC would give them protection, housing and even take care of Izuku's education. His mother had been hesitant back then and he had been too enthusiastic to not accept the offer. Two days later, the HPSC had sent a house-shifting service to their doorstep. The HPSC had them settled in a much more civilized and high-class area in a large 3BHK apartment, something they could never afford before. But now that he had grown up and his worldview had developed beyond the usual black and white it was always portrayed as, he had realized that no one ever gives you anything for free. Recently, he had been growing suspicious of the HPSC and their activities. Not to mention, he himself was getting paranoid day by day. Ever since, he had realized that his powers were just too great to ignore and the fact that anyone would kill for even a fraction of his powers, his suspicion against everyone had increased. He had a feeling that everything that the HPSC had done for him was just a way for them to get him indebted to them. Izuku snorted at that. If they ever so threatened his mother or anyone he cared about, he would not hesitate to kill them. And this was another thing that had changed about him. For the better or worse, he did not know. But his view of heroes and villains had changed. The HPSC had seen to that. No longer did he see the world as black and white. No longer did he believe that the heroes were all saints while the villains were all devils. He had realized along the way that there were flaws in everyone, even heroes, and there was good even in the villains. He no longer shied away from death and murder. Unknown to his mother, of course, one of the HPSC's training program was for him to get familiar with killing. Apparently, according to the HPSC, while heroes should always strive to save everyone, they should always prepare themselves to kill a villain if innocent lives were threatened. That was something about the HPSC that was different from the hero schools. The HPSC did not portray themselves as these saints who never kill. The members of the HPSC did not hesitate from killing. According to them, if the villains ever kill an innocent person, then they give up their rights of being a human and must be dealt with accordingly. And Izuku had been brought up with that same ideology. And while Izuku wanted to save people with a smile on his face, he would not shy away from killing a villain if he ever had to save innocent lives. Here's your breakfast, 
his mother said in a sing-song manner, as she laid the dishes on the dining table. Thanks mom, Izuku said before joining his hands in a small prayer and digging in. His mother had changed a lot since that day too, she no longer had dark circles under her eyes, and the little weight that she had started to gain, she had lost them over the years. She was now much slimmer and her beauty had only grown over the past years. On one of their family outings, she had been approached by a scout of a magazine who wanted her as a model. His mother had been hesitant, but he had encouraged her to pursue a career in modeling, so that she no longer had to waste her time sitting at home. Since, then she had made a big name for herself in the modeling industry and become quite the sensation. She usually models for traditional wares and sport outfits. And every company she had modeled for, had earned huge amounts of profit. Recently, there were talks about her signing a contract with one of the heroes who too was in the same business. His mother had also played an important role in his education. The HPSC wanted to homeschool him, not wanting to let the knowledge of his quirks become public, but his mother had put her foot down not wanting for her son to grow reclusive. By then, she had already started her journey in the modeling business and was able to afford sending him to a school as prestigious as some a private academy. The HPSC had backed down and decided to instead make his real quirks confidential and fabricate a new quirk for him. So, now instead of limitless, six eyes and cursed energy as his quirks, his quirk was space manipulation. And while it still could be considered powerful, it was not as eye catching as it was before. Finishing his breakfast, he washed his hands. He picked up his bag, wishing his mother a good day, he walked out of his house. Don't forget you have a meeting with the HPSC president today, she said before he left. His school was in the walking distance, so like usual he found himself walking at a leisurely pace. He had to say though, this area saw very few villain attacks in a year and was pretty quiet for a neighborhood. Having a high population of rich people around the area, he had assumed that at least thieves would find their way here but seemed like the area was well patrolled or the thieves did not want to break into the houses of rich people anymore. It took him half an hour to reach his school. As he stood in front of the school gate, his school bag slung haphazardly on his right shoulder and his hands in his pockets, he let a nostalgic smile on his face. He would not admit it to anyone, but he would miss this place. He had made many memories while studying here and was eternally grateful to his mother and whatever almighty was there for giving him this opportunity. One of the many memories that flashed in front of his eyes, was the day he had first attended this school. Flashback. Izuku found himself standing in front of the door of the classroom that he had been assigned to. He had his bag slung over his shoulders and his hands in his pocket. He had a mischievous smile on his face. Today was the first day he would attend the prestigious Sumei Private Academy, and he had already prepared himself for a prank. And that was the reason why, he had come wearing bandages wrapped around his eyes. All right class, today we have a new student that will be joining us. Izuku heard the teacher say to the class. He has transferred from another school which is also the reason for the late admission. You can come inside. Once Izuku was called, he opened the door and walked in. Even through the bandages, he could see the curious looks that his soon-to-be classmates were giving him. He walked towards the teacher and stood beside him. Can you please introduce yourself? The teacher asked him. How should I do that? Izuku asked tilting his head slightly. You know. Like the usual. Your name, likes, dislikes and such. The teacher replied kindly. Oh. Izuku gave the class a smile. Well, my name is Izuku Midoriya. My likes, well I like a few things. Dislikes, hum, I don't believe I have any. Hobbies, this and that. And for dreams, hum, yeah, I don't have one. He laughed in his mind. He did not need to remove his bandages to see the utter confusion and shock that his classmates to be were going through. Ah, uh, that was. Quite an introduction, Midoriya, the teacher commented. Sir, I have a question. An uptight voice spoke. And Izuku already knew that this guy would be fun to tease. Ask away Ida. The teacher said. Mr. Midoriya. I want to ask if you are being serious. This is a prestigious school and behavior as such cannot be tolerated. The uptight boy, now named Iida, spoke in a serious tone. H.N. Izuku drawled. Inserting his pinky finger in his right ear and scratching it, he said, Well I am paying, you're paying. We all are paying the school. So, in a way the school owes us not the other way around, right? W what? Iida yelled, indignantly. What kind of incessant talking is this? Izuku laughed. Come on, I am just joking. 
Chill a little dude, you are wasting your youth, he said. I I, Iida sputtered. All right Iida, the teacher interrupted with a sigh. Any more questions for Midoriya here? Several students raised their hands. All right Kamazuko, why don't you ask? Why did you say that you don't have a dream? The aforementioned boy asked. Huh. It's simple really. I don't have a dream. I have a goal. Izuku answered with a smirk. And that would be. An unknown girl asked. Why? Izuku pulled his hands out of his pocket and spread them in front of him dramatically, to surpass all might and become the strongest hero, of course. Well, that is an admirable goal Midoriya. The teacher said with an encouraging smile. What is your quirk? Another unknown boy asked. Hmm, my quirk, Izuku said with a mysterious tone. Well you see. Izuku brought his hands up, his pointy figures pointing towards his eyes. My quirk is, the whole class leaned forward, in suspense. Izuku internally laughed, sensing even the teacher leaned forward, interested. And then, out of nowhere, he enthusiastically yelled out. Blindness. The whole class, including the teacher, hit their heads on their desks while Izuku laughed heartily. Flashback end. Izuku smiled. Those were the days, he thought to himself. Soon, he found himself sitting at his desk in his classroom, right in front of Iida. Good morning, Midoriya, Iida greeted with his usual robotic tone. Hey, Iida. Izuku greeted back with too much enthusiasm for Iida's liking. Long time no see. Where have I been? Iida felt his eyebrow twitch. We met just yesterday, Midoriya. Huh, did we? I don't remember, Izuku said smiling, while rocking to and fro. Iida frowned. While he did not appreciate such dorky attitude, Izuku had grown on him over the years. Have you already submitted your choices for university that you will be choosing? I guess I did. Twitch, and what universities are you going to apply for? I have filled in UA, Shiketsu and CI. Well me? UA, UA and UA, of course. Twitch asterisk Twitch, of course. What can I even expect from you? Iida grumbled. Huh. You're grumbling. That's new. Whatever. And what happened yesterday? Uh, you know about that. Everyone knows about that. What happened? Well, it's not my fault that the thieves were firing their firearms at me. I had to defend myself. I heard that it was you who entered a hostage situation at the bank. Details, details, Izuku said, waving his hand nonchalantly. Of course. Just then, their homeroom teacher walked in with a stack of paper under his arms. He put the stack of paper on the teacher's desk and addressed the class. Good morning, class. Good morning, sir. The class chorused. Now that you are middle school seniors, it is time for you to start thinking about your futures seriously. The teacher announced. Izuku smirked hearing the class grumbled. He leaned back on his chair waiting for the teacher to continue. I will be handing out the printouts for your desired life courses, the teacher said pointing at the stack of paper. The class grumbled even more making the teacher smile and shake his head in exasperation. Who am I kidding? You guys all want to become heroes, right? And just like that, all hell broke loose. The students started cheering loudly. Some started banging their hands on their desks, some started howling. Ida's eyebrows were now twitching violently, and Izuku laughed in his head. He knew Iida wanted nothing more than to jump and scold each and every student, but being the model student he was, he would not do that. All right, all right, calm down. This is a top school, not some crowded marketplace. Behave yourself, the teacher said calming the students out. Now that all of you have calmed down, we can move on to the next topic. Hey, teach. Is someone from our school applying for UA? A student, whose name Izuku for the life of him could not remember, asked. Hum. If I remember correctly, Midoriya and Iida are applying for UA, the teacher announced. And that started a whole new discussion amongst the NPCs. Wait. The two of them? I knew they would apply for UA. But doesn't UA have a really low admission rate? Yeah, I know that but I mean Iida is Ingenium's brother and Izuku is just built different. Yeah. If anyone can enter UA, it has to be those two. Suddenly, Iida stood up. Sir, can we please continue with the lesson? And so, the classes began. Izuku soon found himself dozing off in the class, though no one really bothered him. After all, it was nothing new. After the classes ended, 
Izuku said goodbye to Ida and decided to head towards his next destination. The HPSC headquarters. Though the HQ was in a different city, Izuku had no trouble traveling there. After all, his quirk was able to teleport him through long distances. He walked into an empty alleyway, so as to get away from the prying eyes. Activating his quirk, he disappeared from the ally right beside Sume and appeared in an alley right beside the HQ in Hone. He walked into the HQ and was greeted by a mid-aged woman at the reception desk. The woman looked up from her computer and smiled at him. Uh, Izuku dear. You are here. The president has been waiting for you. The receptionist said. By now, Izuku had visited the HQ so many times, that the workers here had become familiar with him. Thanks. Izuku said as he walked towards the elevator. Pressing the button for the topmost floor and waited in the lift. While he waited, his mind started thinking about his relationship with the president. He had not met her for the first three years while he was being trained and his quirks were experimented on. But then, one day he got a call that the president of HPSC wanted to meet him. Since then, she had taken an interest in his life. He would be called every month where he would be asked about his progress with his quirks and how he was handling his other training programs. He did not know what her endgame was. But he was prepared for the worst anyway. But today was not one of the days where he would be asked to give his progress report. No today was the day he would get his punishment for breaking the law the second time in a month. As he stood in front of the president's door, he knocked on it. Enter. The president's voice came from inside. Opening the door, he shot his hand up in the air. Good afternoon, grandma, he greeted cheerfully. Suddenly, a paperweight came flying at him only to stop inches away from him. He did not flinch, neither did he leave his comical position. Midoriya. Behave. A stern male voice said. Letting the paperweight fall on his hands, he walked up to the president's table and put it there. Huh? Grandpa Yukimaru is here too. How lucky. Midoriya. The president said in an icy tone. Do you have any idea what you did yesterday? Well, self-defense? Self-defense? The president muttered in a low tone before slamming her hands on the table. Self-defense. It was you who walked into the bank which was being surrounded by police by the way. A bank that was being used to keep hostages. And then, you not only just walked into a hostage situation, you actually had the gall to join the hostages. That would have been even better but no you had to go and start a protest against the hostage takers because they were not giving you and the children candies. And then, you went and attacked one of the hostage takers. Hey not my fault that he was treating the old man so badly. All the old man wanted was to go to the toilet, and they were not even allowing him to do that. Not to mention, it was them who started the firing not me. Do you even realize how ridiculous you sound? What would have happened if one of the hostages were to be injured? None of them was injured. I saved them, you know. You illegally used your quirk in public. Do you know how much I had to go through just to get you out of the government's scrutiny? Huh. As if. I am sure that you used the self-defense card to pull me out anyway. The president blushed in fury and pinched the bridge of her nose. Gah! She screamed in frustration. Why the hell can't you be normal for once? Izuku let out a sarcastic laugh. Come on, where's the fun in that? The president let out a sigh of exasperation. Anyway, it has been decided that you would be doing community service as punishment. What? But why? I thought you got me out of the situation. I saved your ass, but even then, your idiot ass walked itself into a dangerous situation. So, either take it or become a vigilante. All right, all right. Don't get your panties in a bunch. Izuku grumbled with a pout. The president felt her eyebrow twitch in annoyance. You will be cleaning Dagoba Beach in Musutafu. You have ten months to clean it all up. If you can't clean it up by the next ten months, your name from UA's rooster will be cut off. Is that a challenge? Izuku asked with a smirk. No, just a punishment. The president remarked. Now on the topic of UA, are you sure you don't want me to recommend you to them? It would save you from the hassle of going through the UA entrance exam. Hey come on grandma, where would be the fun in that? And did not all might also take UA's entrance exams. It would be my first step to surpassing that old guy. The president let out a sigh. Ever since meeting Izuku, she had been sighing way too much. All right, then. You are dismissed. I advise you to start cleaning the beach by tomorrow. All right, I will see to that. Izuku said, leaving the room. Izuku, soon found himself in a train to Musutafu. Now, 
one would wonder why was he not just teleporting there. Mostly because, while teleporting would save his time, Izuku still loved to see the scenery and enjoyed traveling. While he sat in the train, he browsed the internet and soon found out that there had been not one but two villain attacks in a single day. Hum. Seems like the heroes have their hands full these days, Izuku thought to himself. When he reached his destination, he got off the train. Opening his phone once again, he opened the maps and entered the Dagoba beach as his destination. The maps soon displayed the easiest way to the beach. As he peacefully walked through the streets, he noticed that a crowd had gathered near a bridge. Wondering what was happening, Izuku walked towards the crowd. Only to see a skeleton with spiked blonde hair standing behind a light pole. Hey, skeleton man. Whatcha doing here? Izuku asked, slapping the man on the shoulder. But much to his surprise, the skeleton man coughed out massive amounts of blood. Whoa. 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 You all right there, skeleton man? Izuku asked a little concerned with the blood. S skeleton man. The man stuttered indignantly. Wait. You aren't a skeleton? I was quite sure you looked like one. And no, young man. I am not a skeleton. The man said, regaining his composure. Oh, sorry about that. Izuku said, before walking towards the crowd. Pushing his way through the mass of people, he made it to the front where Backdraft was using his quirk to contain the people. To his side were three heroes that had recently earned a lot of popularity, them being Kamui Woods, Death Arms and Mount Lady. What's happening? Izuku asked a civilian standing to his side. A villain has taken a middle schooler hostage and the heroes are doing nothing, the civilian said with a nervous look on her face. Izuku raised an eyebrow at that. He turned to look forward and found a sludge villain holding someone captive in there. Using his ocular quirk, he realized that it was blonde boy that was being held hostage by the sludge villain. The boy was constantly using his quirk which seemed to be some form of explosion quirk. Explosion quirk? Where have I seen that before? Izuku thought to himself with a frown. He often prided himself for his memory, but nothing came to his mind. Meh. No one important most probably. He stared at the situation in front of him. While the boy was using his quirk to save himself from suffocating, he was also making things hard for the heroes. By making those explosions, he was keeping the heroes away from the villain. Not to mention, he was also tiring himself out. If the boy just let his explosions die down, he was quite sure, the heroes could rescue him in no time. Hey, I heard that All Might was in the neighborhood. One of the civilians commented. Why isn't he coming? Making his way through the crowd, Izuku stood right behind Kamui Woods. Hey, Kamui. Why aren't you helping the boy? Unfortunately, Kid Kamui began. None of our quirks are suitable to deal with the situation. Izuku's lips went thin as he stared at the villain obviously trying to choke his victim. You know, I can help in the situation. What? Kamui Woods frowned looking back at him. Well, my quirk should be the most suitable in this situation. Izuku commented, scratching his ear with his pinky finger. What is your quirk kid? Space manipulation. Don't even think about it Kamui. Death Arms warned. We can't let a civilian get involved in this. Well, it is either allow me to help and save the boy or don't let me help and let the boy die. Izuku retorted nonchalantly. Kamui Wood's face showed that he was contemplating his words. Most probably weighing in the pros and cons of the decision. Finally coming to a decision, he looked back at Izuku. Kid, are you absolutely sure you can deal with this? Will only take me a second to deal with the villain. Izuku replied with a smirk. All right, kid. We will let you help. Kamui Woods then looked at Backdraft. Backdraft, let the kid pass. Are you sure, Kamui? Backdraft asked. Yes, we don't have any other solution. Your call cap. With then Backdraft let his water barrier fizzle out letting Izuku pass through them. What are they doing? One of the civilian yelled. Why are they letting a kid walk into such danger? Another asked. Have they gone mad or something? Kamui Woods felt sweat dribble down his forehead. Had he just made the situation worse? Now that he thought about it, he had just let a 15-year-old kid walk into a hostage situation. Shit. What the hell was I thinking? Kamui chided himself internally. Hope the kid lives up to his words. Otherwise, I can kiss my hero career goodbye. Behind the light post, the skeleton man gripped his chest painfully. What the hell was I thinking? He berated himself. 
How could I let something like this happen? Not only have I put a kid in danger but now another kid is going to do the job that should have been mine to begin with. All throughout the chaos, Izuku walked confidently towards the sludge villain. His hands in his pockets, a smirk on his face and long steps that had a certain swagger in them. Halfway through, the sludge villain had finally noticed him. Huh. What is this? Another meat shield for me. Haha. Ha. What a day it is. Come here kid, let me kill you too. How foolish. Izuku breathed out. He held out his right arm and said. Curse technique lapse. Blue, suddenly, the sludge villain felt a pull on itself. What? It asked in confusion. Everyone in the crowd, even the heroes, were amazed when suddenly the sludge villain was pulled towards the green-haired boy's right hand, freeing the blonde boy. A second later, the sludge villain was in Izuku's hand in the form of a sphere. Izuku walked back towards Kamui Woods who held out a bottle speechlessly. Izuku then proceeded to insert the sludge villain in the bottle. Well, there you go, Izuku said, dusting his hands. Damn kid. That is one hell of a useful quirk, Death Arms commented. Yeah. What is your quirk kid? Mount Lady asked. As I said Kamui Woods, it's space manipulation, Izuku said, nonchalantly. Damn, sounds interesting, Death Arms said crossing his arms. You know kid. If you ever want to internship as hero, contact my agency. I would gladly take you as a sidekick, Mount Lady said winking at him. Kamui snorted. As if. He would be most suited in my agency. Mount Lady huffed. Huh. You're just jealous that he is going to join my agency. Not happening. Of course, happening. Not happening. Of course, happening. Not happening. Of course, happening. While Mount Lady and Kamui Woods argued between themselves, Izuku faced Death Arms and asked, Hey, do you know which way the Dagoba Beach is? It's that way, Death Arms said pointing at the right direction. Thanks, Izuku said skipping away from the scene cheerfully. Death Arms blinked as he watched the kid skip his way out of the scene. HN. What an interesting kid. Hey where did the kid go? Mount. Lady yelled making Death Arms sigh. An hour later, Izuku found himself standing at his final destination. Dagoba Beach. He had expected the beach to be filled with trash, but this was something else entirely. It was as if the whole city had decided to dump their trash here. There were old appliances, cars and bikes all scattered around the beach, and he had to clean it in the next 10 months. Izuku smirked confidently. All right then. Let's call this training for UA entrance exams then. Izuku Midoriya stood in front of the bathroom sink, looking at his reflection in the mirror. He grabbed his chin and turned his face left and right as if checking something. He then tilted his head to the left and smirked. He was looking great. He always looked great. Grabbing the sunglasses lying on the rack above the sink and putting them on, he walked out to the dining room, where he was greeted by the sight of his mother cooking breakfast. Izu Chan. Have a seat. Breakfast is almost ready. His mother spoke as she moved from one side of the kitchen to another. After having breakfast, he washed his hands and made the final preparations. He picked up his bag and was about to walk out of the apartment when his mother called out. Izu Chan. Wait. Izuku looked back and saw his mother walk towards him. Standing in front of him, she put her hand forward. Izuku raised his hand and took the item from his mother's hand. He raised an eyebrow when he saw it was a bracelet with the initials, I am, on it. It is for good luck, his mother said. He gave her a bright smile as he put the bracelet on. Thanks, mom. I love it. His mother smiled but fidgeted on her spot. Izuku. Noticing this was a little confused as to why she was acting like this. Is everything all right, mom? He asked, his concern evident in his voice. It's just, she paused as if considering her words. Today is a big day for you. I know you have been preparing your whole life for this day. Don't think that I am doubting you, but are you ready? Mom. I understand you are concerned, but don't worry. I got this. Tears welled up in her eyes. Her hands joined together over her chest, and she smiled at him. I know. I know how strong you are, Izu Chan. And know this. I will always believe in you. Izuku gave her a bright smile and said, I know, mom. And with that, he walked out of the apartment towards his destination. This was it. This was finally it. This was the moment Izuku had been preparing for most of his life. This was his first step toward being a hero. Or more like a licensed hero. 
Izuku Midoriya stared at the four large buildings that made up the main campus of the UA High Academy. Each of these buildings had the outer walls made of glass, but one could not peek inside, though Izuku guessed that those inside could easily see what was going on outside the buildings. These buildings were connected through glass corridors. His dream school was right there in front of him. All of his life, he had dreamed of going to the same school as All Might, and now the time had finally arrived. And all he needed to do was pass the toughest high school entrance exam in the whole country. He scoffed, as if some entrance exam was going to keep him from achieving his goal. He was going to ace the exam, and that was no promise. That was a fact. Izuku Midoriya stared at the wave of students entering the high school through the open gates. The wave of students looked multicolored due to the various school uniforms. They had come from various schools all over Japan. He was wearing the Sume Private Academy uniform. All of these students had come here with the hope that they would pass the entrance exam and take a huge step toward a bright future, but only 40 of them would be selected. Or more like 35 of them, since four of the 40 seats were reserved for the recommended students. And the last seat was his. Just then, he felt someone pat him on the shoulder. I was wondering when you would get here, Iida, Izuku said with a confident smirk. What? Lost your way today? We were supposed to meet at gate 2, not gate 1, Iida said in a dry tone. Izuku let out a sheepish laugh. Hey, hey. I told you I forgot where we were supposed to meet. If you had met us at the right spot, we could have been on time. Now we are 10 minutes late. Iida reprimanded him in a robotic tone while making chopping motions with his hand. Izuku gave him a deadpan look over his sunglasses. You do realize we still have like an hour before the exams start. More like 50 minutes. We are 10 minutes late. As model students of this prestigious academy, we must be more than punctual. Alrighty, Dad. Izuku rolled his eyes sarcastically. Let's get going. Iida huffed in annoyance and was about to start walking when a loud, brash, and downright hostile voice came from behind the duo. Get the fuck out of my way, extras. The duo looked behind them to see a boy with spiky, ash blonde hair walking toward them. The boy was wearing a cream colored coat over a white t shirt and black pants. The sneer on the blonde's face made him look like a villain walking toward his victim. The blonde took long steps that were filled with confidence, his hands were in his pocket. As the blonde walked towards them, he did not change his path. Instead, he bumped shoulders with Izuku, who raised a confused eyebrow at the boy. Don't stand in my way, extra, the blonde said, with an angry snarl. If they had not been in front of UA, the boy would have found himself lying unconscious in a dumpster, covered in his own piss and shit. But Izuku refrained from making a scene, not wanting a blonde Pomeranian to ruin his chances of getting into UA with a clean shit. But it looked like Iida had not gotten the memo. What kind of delinquent behavior is this? Iida yelled in outrage. The fuck did you say, you damn four eyes? The blonde haired Pomeranian barked, rounding on the blue haired boy. Such uncivilized language. This should not be allowed in a prestigious school like UA. Iida would have continued to reprimand the blonde dog if Izuku had not placed a hand on his shoulder. Leave it, Iida. It is better not to get worked up over someone like him. Izuku said coolly. The blonde haired delinquent snarled at Izuku. What the hell did you say, Moss Head? Iida took a deep breath. You're right, Midoriya. I should not get worked up like that. Izuku wasn't sure, but for some reason, shock and recognition ran through the blonde's face. He paid it no mind and started walking towards the open gates, followed closely by Iida. But he was stopped by a whisper from behind him. What did you say? Izuku and Iida turned around and looked at the blonde. Did you say something, blondie? Izuku asked, raising an eyebrow. That name, what did he call you just now? The blonde hissed, as he whirled around and glared at the duo. Whose? Mine? Izuku asked, pointing his right thumb at himself. Well, that would be Izuku Midoriya. Why though? Izuku, Midoriya, the blonde's eyes widened before his eyebrows knitted together and his teeth went bare as he snarled so viciously that it almost made him look like a villain. D.D. Diku. The blonde boy lunged at him, his eyes filled with anger and some amount of madness. Ida's lips parted in shock as the unknown boy suddenly jumped at Izuku, who did not look phased in the slightest. The green-haired boy quirked an eyebrow before raising his left hand, 
the little and ring fingers curling inward while the middle and pointer fingers stuck together and pointed at the sky. Just when the attacker was inches away, he stopped. The blonde boy found himself suspended in the air, his hands still outstretched, and his face contorted into an even angrier look if it was possible. It's you, isn't it Deku? I remember your fucking quirk, you m-o-t-h-e-r-f-u-c-k-e-r. -E you fucking bastard. How dare you come to UA? How dare you try to take my shine away, you fucktard. Iida was once again taken aback by the crass language the boy spoke. But his shock was compounded by the hostility the boy was displaying against Midoriya. It was as if Midoriya had murdered his family or something. Midoriya. Do you know this boy? He asked, but from the look, Midoriya was giving the boy, it did not look like his green-haired friend knew him either. Izuku tilted his head in confusion. Huh. You would think someone like him would make an impression on me, but what do you know? I don't know who this guy is. Are you sure, Midoriya? I mean, knowing you, I would not be surprised if you did something to him. Did something to me? This fucking bastard humiliated me. I had to suffer for six years of my life. At this point, a crowd was starting to gather around the trio of UA hopefuls. Some were wondering what was going on and were asking those who had been present on the scene since the beginning. Some were rooting for the green-haired boy to beat the blonde boy, and some were rooting for the blonde boy. Izuku tilted his head backward in thought before looking at the blonde. You would not be that brat whose girlfriend cheated on him with me, would you? Iida was once again shocked, not by the statement itself, but by the confused look Midoriya was giving the blonde. It almost looked genuine. Did Midoriya do something like that? But then he saw the smirk that came on his face, and he sighed a sigh of relief. As Iida had noticed, Izuku let out a vicious smirk on his face. Are that guy whose mother slept with me and called him a cucky son of a bitch. The blonde screamed to heaven so loudly that the faculty members at UA must have heard his scream. You fucking bastard. Let me go so I can fuck you up, you son of a fucking bitch. My, oh my, that's what your mama said. You, is something the matter. A silky female voice spoke from behind Izuku and Iida. The students gathered at the scene, including Izuku and Iida, all looked towards the entrance gate to UA, and a variety of reactions emerged in the crowd. Every boy, including Iida, and even some of the girls blushed hard. Even Izuku had a light blush on his face before averting his eyes and focusing on the snarling blonde dog. The majority of the girls were glaring at the figure standing near the gate. Why? Because at the entrance stood the ex reeded heroine, Ms. Midnight, in her hero costume. If that could even be called that. On her face were her infamous, purple-rimmed triangular glasses. She was wearing a dark sleeveless biker's jacket that ended a few millimeters below her bountiful chest which had to be at least G-cups with a little sag. The jacket appeared to be five sizes too small, as the chain of the jacket did not even come close to allowing her to chain the jacket up. It completely exposed her gifted breasts. She had two small pouches attached to her breasts, covering her nipples. Around her waist was a utility belt that was loosely tied, causing it to slant toward her left. The utility belt was all that she was wearing to cover her lower parts, at least from what it looked like to most people. And finally, a pair of knee-high bondage boots to complete her costume. She was really living up to her role as the X-rated heroine, the progenitor of all sexy heroes. I it's the X-rated heroine, Ms. Midnight. One of the many hopefuls, of course, a boy, announced enthusiastically. Era, era. You kiddies know of me. Ms. Midnight spoke in a voice that should not even be legal in public. How scandalous. But I love it. A whip appeared in her hands and she cracked it on the ground. The X-rated hero then walked towards the green-haired boy and the blonde-haired boy, the latter of whom was still suspended in the air. If someone asked Midnight, she would say that it was a funny scene, and if it was anywhere else, she might as well enjoy it for a few more minutes, but seeing as it was the UA entrance exam, she decided to intervene. The green-haired boy, much to her amusement, had glanced at her once and then, was focusing on the blonde-haired boy. Midnight walked towards Izuku and stood beside him. Leaning forward such that her ample chest mounds hung like two balloons suspended in the air, she said in a sultry voice, You do know, Greenie, that using your quirk unauthorized is punishable by law. Iida shot forward, making her jump back and lean backward. Standing in front of her, he then bowed deeply. Ms. Midnight. Please forgive my friend for not following the rules. I will make. Iida. Izuku interrupted his friend with a stern voice. 
Why are you apologizing for something that wasn't our fault? Iida gritted his teeth and leaned towards Izuku, whispering into his ear. Midoriya. I am trying to salvage the situation here. Don't make it any worse. And what? Izuku said, coldly, take the blame for this blonde hero wannabe. You're maybe willing to let others trample over you, but I am not Iida. Midoriya. This is not, all right, all right, boys. Midnight interrupted, clapping her hands together twice. As much as this excites me, I am quite sure you have an entrance exam to be part of. And Greeny, let Blondie down, would you? Izuku's face clearly showed his distaste for the situation. If he could, he would have the blonde thrown out of the exam. He could always call the president and get him sued for something, but that would be petty. And Izuku was only petty in his thoughts. The green haired boy let out a scoff and pulled his infinity back, letting the blonde fall on his butt. Midnight. Seeing this clapped happily. See, was it tough? No, Izuku muttered, averting his eyes once again. For once, he was regretting having six eyes which allowed him to even read someone's mind to some extent. Midnight crossed her hands below her chest, unknowingly or knowingly. Izuku was pretty sure that was the case seeing as the kind of thoughts running through her mind, accentuated her breasts. She looked sternly at the blonde boy. And you, young man, I don't think I have to tell you where you were wrong, right? She said. Once again, a myriad of emotions ran through the blonde's face, from shock to anger, and then, more anger. He scoffed, getting up and dusting his backside. Inserting his hands in his pocket to appear cool, he glared at the ground. Behavior like yours cannot be tolerated, young man, Midnight continued. You are here to be heroes, so act like it. That only made the blonde sneer even more viciously. Am I understood? The blonde nodded, but his angry face remained. Am I understood? This time, Midnight raised her voice slightly. Yes. Came the miffed response from the blonde. Yes, what? Understood, Ms. Midnight. Midnight nodded in satisfaction. She then cracked her whip to the ground. What are you guys waiting for? This is not a movie. Get to the exams. That startled everyone as they realized that they only had 20 more minutes before the exam started. Everyone started rushing towards UA Ida being one of them, as the blue haired boy thought that Izuku would follow behind him. Unfortunately, Izuku did not. He decided to walk there at a steady pace. Hey, Greeny. Izuku stopped and turned around. Yes? What's your name? Midnight asked, smirking when she realized the boy was doing his best to not let his eyes wander downward. Izuku Midoriya. Midnight's eyes widened with what Izuku guessed was recognition. Midoriya, you say, she muttered, before Kat walking towards Izuku. Once beside him, she bent down and planted a soft kiss on his right cheek. That's for good luck, okay. She said before starting to walk away with a sway in her hips. Make sure you pass, Midoriya. I will be watching you very closely. Izuku watched Midnight leave not understanding what that was all about. What the hell just happened? He whispered to himself. He then pulled out his handkerchief and rubbed the wet spot on his cheek. Pervert. A feminine voice deadpanned at him from behind. He spun around quickly. Had he been so shocked that he had dropped his guard without noticing? He raised an eyebrow when he noticed a purple-haired girl staring at him with a scrutinizing look. She was wearing a green-colored blazer and pants. But the most noticeable feature on her had to be the long earlobes with jacks at the end. What? Izuku asked with a frown. You are one of those perverts, aren't you? Those perverts that get aroused by women like her? Izuku let out an impressed whistle. Damn, you just judged two people in one breath, whom you haven't even talked to. You do realize we're no longer living in the 20th century, right? The purple-haired girl rolled her eyes sarcastically and huffed. Whatever. Perverts like you are the reason why heroes like her exist. Izuku blinked as she walked past him. This was a weird day, wasn't it? Izuku fell behind her with his hands in his pocket. For your kind information, I am no pervert, Izuku said walking behind her, and she may be flirty, but it is her choice, right? Ain't that the way feminists define their undesirable actions? Izuku finished with a smirk. The purple-haired girl spun around and began walking backward while glaring at him with her hands on her hips. Don't bring feminists in it. You don't know what we women go through. Huh. Izuku brought his right hand up and placed it horizontally above his eyes and started turning his head left and right, as if looking for something. Woman. I don't see one. The purple-haired girl growled. 
Women like her are the reason why women everywhere are being sexualized. Because of women like her, most people think that female heroes are just eye candies and nothing else. Izuku shook his head. You would be wrong about that. Midnight has been the most vocal when it came to women's empowerment. Especially at a time when female heroes were considered nothing more than sidekicks. Her court battle against the HPSC for costume regulations is an infamous one and was praised by everyone around the world. The purple-haired girl let out a scoff of disgust. Of course, it would be praised. All they want is to see some tits and nothing else. The purple-haired girl not wanting to argue any further, increased her pace of walking. Izuku smiled knowing that the girl was right. Maybe Midnight had fought the court battle thinking that it would progress the society. After all, there were male pro heroes who went topless many times, so why could female heroes not do that? But in the end, most of the praise had come from males around the world and he knew exactly why. His mind wandered to Midnight's reaction to his surname. She had seemed familiar with the name, Midoriya, and he did not know how. There was a possibility that she had recognized his mother's surname and connected the dots. His mother was quite famous in the modeling world and a heroine like her who was known for doing modeling as a side job, would know someone like his mother. Soon, Izuku found himself in front of the room in which the written exam would take place. Entering the room, he began scanning it for the blue-haired boy, whom he found to be sitting at the top. He walked up the stairs taking two steps at a time and reached the boy in a few seconds. Taking the seat beside him, he put the bag on the desk. Where have you been? His friend hissed from beside him. I got held by Ms. Midnight for some reason, Izuku answered, as he pulled the writing board, pens, and pencils and arranged them neatly on the desk. Iida raised a curious eyebrow at him. Ms. Midnight? Why? Izuku felt his hand unconsciously move to the spot where she had left a kiss before he shook himself away from the thought. Uh, I have no idea. Iida gave him a suspicious look and Izuku returned a sheepish smile. Just then, a figure entered the room from a separate door and stood at the podium that was positioned at the front of the semicircular rows of desks and benches. The figure's face was covered by what looked like a tan gas mask shaped a little like a horse. On his head was a cowboy hat with a thick metallic plate at the front. He was wearing a large red clock over a plain black tank top with white armor strapped over the right side of his body. Around his waist was a brown belt with a gun holster strapped to it. For pants, he was wearing light brown and baggy pants. Overall, the figure looked like a stereotypical cowboy. H.N. Guess, that makes sense that he would be the invigilator of this exam, Izuku whispered. Iida who had heard him nodded his head. Snipe was known for his sharp vision and who would be better than him to guard an exam in which thousands of students would be taking part in such a large room. Izuku glanced at his friend. The blue-haired boy had his arms crossed over his chest and was tapping his fingers against his forearms. Izuku chuckled to himself. Looked like Iida was nervous. You did not get to see something like that every day. Good morning, examinees. The figure greeted. I hope most of you would know who I am. But for those who don't, I am Snipe. And I will be your invigilator for the written portion of the exam. Now, you will all be receiving your question papers and answer sheets right now. Izuku raised an impressed eyebrow when said papers rolled out from the top of the desks like some fax machine. He had guessed that someone would be distributing the papers to them but then again, it was UA. Nothing about them was normal. Before you start writing, I will tell you something. Look down below at your desks you would be seeing a drawer with a red LED on it. Izuku did as was said and found what the pro hero was talking about. When you finish your exam, you are to submit your answer sheets inside that drawer. The pro hero explained. The drawer's LED will turn green an hour later. It signals that you can submit your paper. You all have three hours to complete your exams. After that, you would be given three extra minutes in which you need to put your papers inside the drawer. After the three minutes mark is crossed, the drawer's LED will turn red, and you will no longer be able to submit your paper. So, I suggest you submit your papers before the time is up. And another thing, the pro hero paused causing a dramatic effect, don't cheat. Don't talk to your neighbor. Don't do anything stupid. If I see you talking or even whispering, you will be disqualified. Understood? No one said anything. No one asked any questions either. Snipe nodded his head. You can start now. The sound of multiple wrappers being ripped apart could be heard throughout the room. Izuku leisurely tore the wrapper and glanced over the questions in the question paper. Hum. 
For an exam that is called the toughest, these questions seem easy. Izuku thought to himself, or are they? Then again, he would not know. Thanks to the six eyes, not only had his perception increased but the processing power of his brain had increased exponentially too. Due to this, any subject Izuku studied, he could grasp the concepts with ease. With the HPSC, their educators had made Izuku go through master level subjects just as an experiment, and a month later, Izuku returned to the HPSC with full mastery over aerodynamics physics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. It took the green haired boy exactly an hour to finish the whole test. Glancing down, he noticed that the drawer's LED was glowing green. Pulling the drawer open, he put the paper inside before closing it. He glanced up and noticed Snipe looking right at him. He raised a hand. Yes, examinee 7112? Snipe asked. I have finished my exam. Can I leave the room? Sure. Make sure to get to this room two and a half hours later. Snipe said with a disinterested shrug. But he was anything but. He was impressed that the boy had finished the test so quickly. Either the boy had only attended a few questions or else the boy had some form of intelligence quirk. As Izuku walked down the stairs, his enhanced eyes saw the shocked looks his fellow examinees were giving him. It made him smirk. Poor dudes, fighting for a position in this school. Izuku found himself walking into the cafeteria of the high school. He had to say, it was impressive how huge this place was. As he explored the cafeteria, he noticed lunch rush behind the counter. Guess everyone here is a hero, huh? Walking up to the chef hero, he ordered a bowl of katsudan and some sweets. Lunch rush smiled at him and handed him his lunch. He found an empty seat and after eating his lunch, he decided to take a nap. Two and a half an hour later, Izuku found himself sitting in the same room where the written exams had taken place. Beside him, to his left, was Iida who was sitting stiffly and tapping his fingers on his knees. Just then a very notable pro hero walked into the auditorium and stood at the podium. The pro hero was slim, tall, and had long blonde hair spiked upwards in a large tuft behind his head with a small brown mustache. His hero costume consisted of a black jacket with a very tall collar, upturned and complete with studs, and matching black pants and knee-high boots. He had tan shoulder pads and a red belt and elbow pads, all studded, and black fingerless gloves. His neck was obscured by a directional speaker. He was wearing a pair of headphones with the word, Hage, written on the headband and a pair of orange tinted shades. Hey there, little fellows. Give me a H-E-Y-Y-Y. He, Izuku yelled, enthusiastically while pumping his fist. But no one else had yelled. That would embarrass anyone, but Izuku was hardly a normal person. Beside him, Ida's eyebrows twitched. Of course, Midoriya had to go and act childish at such a crucial moment. Wow. What a lively audience. The pro hero took the silence in strides. You guys should learn to chill like that kid over there. The pro hero commented pointing at Izuku. Now, give me a yeah. Why yeah? Once again, Izuku fist pumped and yelled. But other than him, no one else followed. Well, for those who don't know me, I am present Mike. The pro hero introduced himself. And I am here to tell you all about the practical portion of the exam. The screen behind him lit up and a presentation was displayed. The presentation showed different sites in which the examinations would be taking place. There were seven examination sites each denoted by the alphabets of the English language. The details in the screen behind me can also be found on the instruction sheets you were all handed when entering this room. All of you will be divided between these sites that we call cities. Present Mike pointed at the screen. There will be an equal number of examinees in each of these cities. Students from the same school will be allocated different sites so that it is fair and students from the same school don't end up helping each other. The screen then flashed and a new presentation was displayed. It showed four different robots by the names, one pointer, two pointer, three pointer, and, Izuku found that interesting. There was no point allocated for the last robot. There was a brief description of the robot in a square box like all other robots though. The pro hero then continued. Each of these cities would be filled with villain bots that go by the names one pointers, two pointers, and three pointers. How many of them will you find there? I will keep that for you all to find. The names of these robots also denote the amount of villain points you will be awarded if you take them down. A one pointer will give you one point. A two pointer will give you two points and so on. You all will have 10 minutes to collect as many points as you can. 
Use your quirk and disable these robots. That's the point of the exam. Oh, and also, don't go playing anti-hero and start attacking your fellow examinees. That will get you an instant disqualification. Ieda raised his hands as the pro-hero finished his speech. Yes, candidate 7111. Sir, I do not know why, but you missed one of the robots here. It has three question marks at the place where its name should be. Such mistakes should not be expected from a prestigious school like UA. Izuku slapped a hand on his forehead. He had thought he had tamed Ida's rather obnoxious personality when it came to perfection, but it seemed he had failed. Spectacularly at that too. Sheesh, you need to take a chill pill little listener. But he does bring a nice point. Present Mike stated in a guffawed tone. Anyways, as for the unnamed villain bot. The screen then zoomed in on the only bot whose name was not displayed. And then, the fizzled out and in its place was displayed a simple number. 50%. You see when you graduate from UA, you all will have to work as sidekicks of pro heroes. And during that time, you would come to find that there are many villains whom you can't fight. The pro hero you will be a sidekick for will order you to leave these villains and save civilians. If you decide to engage the villain disregarding the pro hero's orders, not only will you find your hero license disqualified but also under multiple lawsuits and heavy scrutiny. Present Mike paused for a second to let the information in. Think of this villain bot as an example of this real life scenario. It is an order from the UA higher ups that you do not engage this bot. One of these bots will be present at every site. And if you attack the bot, you will lose 50% of the points you have earned along with being banned from participating in the entrance exam for the next three years. The whole room was quiet as they understood the implications of trying to attack the villain bot. At that moment, the majority of the students decided not to even go near the bot during the exam. If you guys have understood the assignment, give me a yeah. Why yeah? Izuku fist pumped. And like the times before no one yelled other than him. Why don't you guys get a start? Plus ultra. Plus ultra. That got the response that present Mike wanted. Huh, that always works. He muttered watching the students file out of the room one by one. Twenty minutes later, Izuku Midoriya stood in front of a whole city surrounded by huge walls. Even after knowing about the huge campus it boasted, he still could not help but be awed by just how big UA truly was. They had to be transported to the city by bus which was even more shocking. Izuku had been allocated to City A while Ieda had been allocated to City E. After all the formalities were done, they were asked to change into their gym clothes or as UA defined, combat clothes. Izuku had worn a tight-fitting short sleeve shirt that clung to his body and displayed his rippling muscles and the abs that he had developed over the years. Combined with the shirt, he wore tan baggy training pants with a black belt weaved through the waist and black martial arts boots. Ieda had preferred wearing the gym outfit of Sumei Academy which consisted of a body-fitting blue shirt with white stripes, and pants with a similar design that ended above his knees. Both of them had boarded different buses after wishing each other, best of luck. He had seen underground training bases of the HPSC but compared to UA, even the HPSC's training grounds looked small. And there were six more cities under UA just how large was UA that they had city blocks of this size built. How and where did they get so much funding to build something like that? He did a few stretches to loosen up his muscles before the exam started. And, begin. Izuku heard present Mike announce. He didn't linger for a second longer. Using cursed energy to strengthen his legs, he dashed towards the gate that led to the city, leaving a cloud of dust and shocked examinees behind him. What are you guys waiting for? That guy has the right idea. Go. 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 Present Mike announced again. That sprung all of them in motion. The examinees rushed into the city only to have their eyes widen in shock as almost every other villain bot in the city had been torn down to pieces. The mechanical parts of the bots could be seen scattered around the street. W what t the h hell, dude? One of the examinees exclaimed staring at the destruction in front of his eyes. Just then, a loud explosion caused them to jump in shock. In the distance, they saw mechanical parts flying in the air before falling to the ground. We, we can't l let that guy t take it all. Another examinee yelled springing into motion. The other examinees followed him trying to find any villain bot left in the city. As for Izuku, he was having the best time of his life. It had been a long time since he could let go like this. Even when training with the HPSC trainers, he had to pull back his punches lest he ended up killing them. 
but seeing as these were just robots, he decided to use his true strength. Appearing in the city, he noticed his first obstacle. A three-pointer. Its head zoomed in on him, its red ruby-like eyes noticing him. But before it could do anything, Izuku appeared in front of it. Extending his right arm straight out creating 90 degrees with his body. He moved his arm forward, performing a lariat on the robot. It caused one of the robot's shoulder guns to fly away and hit a two-pointer destroying the latter in the process. Izuku smirked witnessing how fragile the robots were. He grabbed the body of the three-pointer he had just destroyed and flung it at another three-pointer taking it out. Standing upright, he looked forward to see more robots line up for him to destroy. He rolled his shoulders and smiled. This is going to be fun, he said and dashed at the robots. Appearing in front of a one-pointer, he roundhouse kicked it at a two-pointer destroying both of them. He then appeared in front of a three-pointer, he jumped over its head and landed on the gap between its shoulder guns. Grabbing the shoulder guns, he ripped them apart and threw them at two incoming one-pointers. He grabbed the body of the destroyed three-pointer with his left hand and used it as a glove as he punched three more two-pointers, destroying them in seconds. He then threw the body at a one-pointer and took it down. He moved fast and appearing above a three-pointer, he dropkicked the robot shattering it to pieces. Izuku was enjoying ripping the robots apart. More robots appeared in front of him and he would only smirk, crushing them with mere punches. The same occurred for three more minutes. Izuku kept destroying any robot he found or any robot that came his way. All the while, smiling in exhilaration. But when Izuku landed on the ground to take a small breather, he found himself surrounded by ten robots. Three three-pointers, three two-pointers, and four one-pointers. Hey! The side of his lips quirked upwards as he noticed the robots preparing to attack him. The machine guns in the hands of the one-pointers, the three laser guns on the head of the two-pointer, and the shoulder guns of the three-pointers, all pointed at him. A moment later, every gun was fired but none of the bullets or lasers touched him. Izuku at the last moment jumped up in the air. He flipped himself so that he was upside down. He then grabbed his right wrist with his left hand and pointed his right palm at the spot where he was just standing. The spot which was the center of the circle formed by the villain bots. Suddenly, all the villain bots stopped shooting and a second later all of them got attracted to the spot and smashed against each other. Izuku flipped again and gently descended to the ground. Moving his left hand, he grabbed his right shoulder and flexed it a little. Ah, nothing compares to this, he said in a relaxed tone. He then turned to his left and saw another assortment of robots down the street. Smiling in joy, he pounced on them, ripping each one apart with glee on his face. As he kept destroying robot after robot, he lost any sense of time. He felt something that he never thought he could feel. He felt free. Free to use his strength. Free to use his speed. Free to use his cursed energy. Free to use his powers as much as he wanted and as he liked. Appearing in front of a two-pointer, he reared his right arm back. His right hand formed a fist. He then moved it toward the bot. Just a millisecond before his fist connected with the robot, he sent a flash of cursed energy to his fist. Black flash. Izuku whispered as his fist connected with the robot. The punch was so strong that it sent shockwaves down the street. The robot was sent flying in the opposite direction faster than a racing car. It crashed with another robot but did not stop and continued on the path with the other one. The duo crashed with another robot. The trio with another. The number of robots kept increasing until a large line of them was formed which then crashed into a building but instead of stopping there, went right through it into another street. Suddenly, his eyes caught something. A robot was hovering over a spiky, blonde-haired boy who looked like he was goofing or something. His face was set in a comical look. When Izuku saw the robot raise its arm, he acted fast. Appearing above the two-pointer with a burst of speed, he grabbed the raised hand and tore it out of its socket. He then used the torn hand of the robot and slammed it against the robot taking it out in the process. Landing in front of the boy, who was now walking in circles, Izuku asked, Hey, are you alright? We, was the only thing the boy said. Izuku grabbed his chin and thought. Hum. Looks like quirk backlash. Guess, I should bring you to safety. He then grabbed the boy and held him under his arms. Bringing his hands together, he formed the snake hand seal and appeared at the front gate. He put the boy down there. Then using his quirk, he appeared on the roof of a building, standing on the railing. He then glanced down and saw several examinees trying to find bots to destroy. 
Just how many of those bots are there? He asked himself before shrugging and squatting down to watch the examinees run around. Who cares? I already have 170 points. I can just stay here and watch the show. In a dark room with numerous television screens, several figures could be seen watching the examinees take their practical exams, some of whom were Midnight, Snipe, and Present Mike. Quite the lively crop we have this year, huh? Snipe commented watching one of the televisions that displayed a boy with multiple arms standing on the roof of a building. True. A lot of them have quite the flashy quirks, Present Mike pointed out, watching a blue-haired boy running very fast and smashing robots with powerful kicks. Hey, isn't that the Eda kid? Yeah, he is Tensai's brother. A figure wearing a large excavator-shaped helmet confirmed. Huh. Kid seemed a bit too strict for my liking, Mike commented. Hum. There are quite a few creative ones too, a humanoid block of cement said looking at the screens displaying a girl with brown hair and round chicks, a girl with purple hair and long earlobes, and a practically invisible girl. Impressive, indeed, Snipe said looking at the screens. The brown-haired girl was using her quirk on already destroyed robots and gathering points. The purple-haired one was using her jack-like earlobes to create vibrations and damage the robots and the invisible girl had found the stop buttons on the robots and was using them to gather points. We have quite the explosive one here, a bulky and muscular figure with silver hair pointed at the screen. The figure wearing the excavator-shaped helmet looked at the mentioned screen and almost cried in despair when he saw a blonde boy standing on a pile of robots with a ferocious look on his face. That boy looked like he has a lot of anger issues, Midnight commented with a frown. Ah. So, that's the boy who was causing a scene at the gate? Mike asked looking at Midnight. One of them, Midnight pointed out, but surely, the one who would require the most work on. If I did not know better, I would assume he was a villain or something. Hum. Guess, he is your responsibility, Vlad. Snipe remarked getting a sigh from the silver-haired, bulky hero. Why can't Izawa have him? The blood hero groaned dejectedly. Well, because none of us would want Izawa to die this year. Midnight stated dryly. A. Why? Mike pitched in looking confused. Because he is definitely getting this one, the weird rat-looking creature sitting on Midnight's lap declared cheerfully pointing at one particular screen. All of them turned their eyes to the mentioned screen and all of them understood what Midnight was saying. The screen panned on a spiky, green-haired boy wearing sunglasses. The clothes he had chosen for the test were interesting since they showed his martial arts history or at least they hoped they did. But what caught their eye was the way the boy weaved through the numerous villain bots and was destroying them like they were nothing. The boy was making the villain bots look fragile when they were anything but. The boy had jumped the fastest when Mike started the exam. The rat-looking mammal spoke with excitement. He covered the distance to the gates fastest among all other candidates, surpassing even Ingenium's brother's speed. So, a speed-based quirk, Mike asked but then realized something as he looked at the boy destroy another batch of villain bots. Can't be. Vlad King said with a shake of his head. That boy is destroying the robots too easily for someone with a speed-based quirk. So, strength then? Mike asked again. More like an enhancement type quirk, Snipe chimed in. Just then, the boy found himself surrounded by ten villain robots. The rat-shaped mammal let out a laugh that sent chills down everyone's spine. Nezu, Vlad King gulped. What are you planning? The rat-shaped mammal, now identified as Nezu, said nothing. He just jabbed one of his paws on a button. The robot surrounding the green-haired boy all pointed their guns at him. Snipe jumped out of his seat and slammed his hands against the table. What are you doing Nezu? Let's just watch, Nezu said, and then the bots fired much to everyone's apprehension. But they were greatly relieved when they saw the boy jump up in the air and then confused when they saw the boy flip upside down and point his right palm at the center of the circle formed by the robots. And then, were once again shocked, when the robots were pulled to the center causing them to smash against each other effectively destroying all of them. Damn. Mike whistled, impressed by what he saw. What the hell just happened? Vlad asked staring at the screen wide-eyed. Interesting, isn't it? Nezu said letting out a small laugh. You see, the boy does not have a speed-based quirk or a strength-based quirk. But then, what does he have? Midnight asked curiously. From what his files say, Nezu continued, the boy's quirk is called space manipulation. 
space manipulation. A figure, wearing a large trench coat with a high collar and a mask that made him look like a dinosaur, who had been quiet since the beginning asked. Like the prison hero. I don't think so, ectoplasm, Nezu said staring at the boy. How many villain points does he have? Mike commented getting nods from others. 100 villain points, Nezu stated, excitement flashing in his eyes. 100 points, Mike exclaimed in surprise. B but? All Might had the highest villain points, right? Yep, Nezu said, but the kid surpassed All Might by 3 points, and with 4 minutes still remaining. But he has yet to surpass All Might's impressive hero points. Even then, it is impressive, Ectoplasm commented. I don't like him. Everyone turned towards the man at a corner of the room. The man had shaggy black hair and dark circles under his eye. He was inside a yellow colored sleeping bag that made him look like a caterpillar. Oh please, Midnight rolled her eyes sarcastically. You don't like anyone, Aizawa. It does not make sense. Aizawa had a blank look on his face. His eyebrows furrowed in contemplation. The kid fights way too well. He is destroying robots too easily. Too efficiently. There is something fishy going here. Hey, hey. Mike jabbed his pointer fingers in the air and at Aizawa. My friend. Aren't you judging the kid too soon? I know, right? Midnight looked at the shaggy haired man. That blonde haired boy is destroying villain bots left and right. And so is the Iida kid. Do you think something fishy is going there too? Aizawa's eyebrows knitted in a frown. You guys are not getting it. What I meant is that there is too much efficiency in how the kid is taking down the bots. Look at the blonde haired kid. He is sloppy. He is relying on his quirk to do the job for him. The blue haired kid too has judgment issues. His movement is erratic and incoordinated. In other words, both of these kids have signs of unprofessionalism in their movements that shows their inexperience in a real world fight. The people in the room could not refute the observation. They had noticed these two. Now a look at the green haired kid, Aizawa continued, and tell me. Do you see any sloppy movements? Do you see any lapse in judgment? Do you see a hint of unprofessionalism in his movements? And once again they could not refute his claims. They watched as the boy continued destroying robots left and right, his hands slicing through them like a knife through butter. The boy was too good. There were no hesitations to facing the robots. The boy did not stop once, even when he was surrounded by 20 robots. The boy kept going and kept destroying. Midnight squirmed in her seat as she watched the boy destroy robot after robot causing Nezu to get up from her lap and jump up to the table. Her eyes dilated and a blush formed on her face when Izuku destroyed God knows how many robots in just one punch. Well, that adds 70 more points, Nezu commented with barely hidden glee. Mike let out a whistle. Damn. 70 points in just one punch. His eyes then went towards Midnight whose face was flushed and was rubbing her thighs together. You alright there Kayama? Oh, you don't have to worry about me. Midnight moaned with a sadistic smile on her face. I am fine, in fact, I have never been more than fine. Aizawa let out a sigh. Even if his friend was naive, he wasn't. He was sure what kind of thoughts were going through the X-rated heroine's mind right now. If he got the green-haired menace, then he would have to keep the boy miles away from her. The group of people then watched as the boy disappeared and appeared above a robot, tearing its arm off and then using the arm to destroy the robot, thus saving another boy in the process. Hum. Seems heroic enough, huh? Snipe asked once again impressed by the display. Compounded on his already impressive villain points, Nezu declared. How much does he have? Snipe asked curiously. Hum. Nezu looked at the tablet in his hands. With the last tally, 186 points. Only 12 points away from breaking your record, all might. The rodent human hybrid glanced at the hulking figure sitting in a secluded corner of the room. But the figure did not say anything. It just stared at the screen intently. Especially on the screen showing a particular green haired boy. Fuck. Midnight cursed knowing just how big that meant. The cement human hybrid rubbed his forehead. 186 points in just 7 minutes. And to come this close to All Might's total points with just villain points. What are they feeding kids these days? His eyes went towards the excavator mask wearing man who was on the ground on his hands and knees. You feeling all right there, power loader. My robots, Cementos, my precious robots, the pro heroes screamed in despair. Well. The kid managed to break one of us, I guess. 
Snipe joked staring at the wailing man. Their eyes widened in amazement as the boy then grabbed the blonde boy he had saved and suddenly disappeared from the screen. What? Ectoplasm blinked. He is there, the humanoid cement-looking man, now identified as Cementos, said pointing at the screen displaying the entrance gate to City A. They watched as the green-haired boy put the blonde-haired boy down and then once again disappear. This time he's here. Ectoplasm pointed out at the screen displaying the drone shots which showed the green-haired boy had appeared on the roof of a building and stood on the railing. Uh? Mike began scratching the back of his head, I don't know about you guys, but does space manipulation do that? Theoretically speaking, Nezu started explaining, it should be able to. By compressing space at point 1 and expanding space at point 2, one should be able to transport from point 2 to point 1. What needs explaining is, does space manipulation provide super strength or high speed? Aizawa asked with a frown. Hum. Again, theoretically, it should not, Nezu said, before raising his paws in excitement, Welp. Seems like we almost forgot about the final test. Huh. Mike exclaimed. Is it time already? Wait. We did not even examine the other student's performance. Nezu shrugged. Meh. We can do that later. But not this. Mike, if you would. Present Mike grabbed the speaker on the front table and brought it near his mouth. Two more minutes left, he announced. And with that, the rat-shaped mammal slammed its paws on a red button. Izuku watched from his position on the building as the examinees ran around like headless chickens trying to find more robots to destroy. Two more minutes left, the voice of present Mike echoed through the city. Eh? Eight minutes already went by? That was quick. Izuku blinked when he felt a tremor. He then looked in the direction from where he had felt that come and his eyes widened in surprise when he saw a robot, bigger than all the multi-storied buildings in the city, burst out of the ground. Damn. What is UA even doing with something like that? Izuku asked staring at the giant robot. The robot then started moving toward where the majority of the candidates were. Izuku looked down and saw everyone running towards the gate. Understandable, Izuku thought. We were specifically told to avoid this one. But, present Mike's speech ran through his mind. Something about the wording is wrong. Wait. Ah, uh, of course. I understand what you did there. Present Mike. Help. Izuku's eyes were immediately drawn to the source of the sound. He saw the purple girl from before trapped under some rubble. The robot was covering the distance very quickly and was almost on the girl. Izuku was about to act when he saw something. Something very interesting. A candidate from the crowd of running students, an orange-haired girl specifically, had made a sprint toward the girl. Izuku squatted down as he watched the girl rush to help the boy. How very interesting, Izuku thought watching the orange-haired girl struggle to get the purple-haired one out. He let out an impressed whistle when the orange-haired girl's forearms enlarged and she easily picked up the debris before throwing it away. Izuku watched the orange-haired girl converse something with the purple one which Izuku guessed was her asking if the other girl was fine. She then picked up the purple-haired girl in her arms, carrying her bridal style, and made a run for the entrance gate. Guess not everyone is here for fame and money. Izuku let a smile out but it diminished when he realized the robot was on them already. In the dark room, the rat-shaped mammal sat on the table as he watched the screen with excitement and barely content glee. He hit another button and watched the robot raise its arm. Behind him, everyone was screaming for him to stop. Nezu. What are you doing? The X-rated heroine screamed dreadfully. Damn it Nezu. You're taking it too far, the cowboy hero yelled. Nezu. Are you trying to get US pseudo or something? Cementos shouted at the rodent. Nezu. Stop this right now. Even Aizawa yelled out staring at the rodent in barely hidden horror. But the rodent-looking creature did not care. All he wanted, was to see more. He wanted to see what else the green-haired boy was capable of doing. Was he going to be sued if he continued with what he was doing? Yes. Was he going to be jailed if students died under his eyes? Definitely. But his curiosity was getting the better of him. And so, he hit another button and watched in equal amounts of apprehension and excitement what was going to happen. Izuku stared at the giant robot with a confused frown when the robot raised its arm as if getting ready to strike. What is Yue thinking? Izuku thought and then his eyes widened when he saw the robot's hand move. Shit. Acting in an instant, he brought his hands together in a snake seal and vanished from the spot. In the dark room, 
Everyone could only watch in horror as the hand of the giant robot descended on the two examinees. And then, something even more horrifying happened. Midnight's hands were covering her mouth and her eyes were wide in horror. Mike had his hands on his head, his mouth agape, and his eyes wide in despair. Snipe, Aizawa, Cementos, Powerloader, and Ectoplasm were looking with eyes wide at the scene. What happened, you may ask? You see, when the orange-haired girl that had saved the purple-haired one, had seen the robot's hand descend on them, she had thrown the purple-haired girl away from harm completely discarding her own life at that moment. And then, the robot's hand made contact with the ground, causing a large explosion and sending dust and smoke everywhere. W what H have you done? Midnight exclaimed in anguish. But the rodent did not say anything. Instead, ha, ha ha, ha 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 ha. He broke out into a maniacal laughter. Mike looked at Nezu, he has gone full mental. But the principal had not. Then, why was he laughing like that? Because the person of his curiosity had disappeared from the screen Nezu was looking at just before the robot's hand had made contact with the ground. Wait. Look. Ectoplasm said pointing at a screen. Everyone turned toward the screen. The dust and smoke had cleared a bit. And it revealed that the robot's hand had not even touched the ground. And just in front of the robot's hand, shrouded by the dust and smoke still, a shadowy figure could be seen standing. I knew it. I knew it. Nezu yelled and began laughing maniacally again. Back in City A, the candidates stared in absolute shock and befuddlement at what had just transpired. They knew that UA was the best hero school in the country and one of the topmost in the world, but for them to be this hardcore, wasn't something they thought was possible. They had just seen UA kill two candidates just like that. It was then all of them realized that what present Mike had said was true. They could not take on something like that. It was really like a real life simulation but with real life consequences. W what t the hell? A candidate whispered, his voice etched with horror. And then, the dust cleared a bit and they could see a purple haired girl on her butt staring ahead. Then, the dust cleared a little more and a lot of them sighed in relief when they saw the orange haired girl was safe too. But wait. How? They had just seen the robot's hand crush the orange haired girl. Then how was she safe? The dust cleared and they finally found the savior of the girls. Because standing in front of the orange-haired girl was the same green-haired boy from before. The boy that had been destroying robots like they were made of paper. As for the orange-haired girl, she was completely prepared to say goodbye to her life. The moment she had seen the robot's hand plunge at them, she had thrown the girl she had saved to safety. She could not let someone die on her watch. She had closed her eyes and waited for the pain to come but it never did. For one moment, she thought maybe she was already dead, but that was broken when she heard a voice. An almost melodious voice. Hey! You alright? The orange-haired girl opened her eyes and saw the green-haired boy that had wreaked havoc in the city. He was standing in front of her. His left arm was positioned horizontally in front of his chest with his hand making a claw-like shape. His right hand formed a spirit gun and was pointing at the ground. And then there was the robot's arm. It was inches away from the boy and looked like it was being held by some form of barrier. The robot's arm was shaking slightly as if the robot was trying to free its hand but was unable to. Yo. You all right or not? The boy said again. The orange-haired girl shook herself out of the stupor. Yes. Yes, I am all right. The boy smiled at her. Well, that's good. He said and then looked over at the robot and smirked. Just stay there. It won't take more than a few seconds. Izuku moved his left arm and placed his left palm an inch away from the robot's hand. A bluish energy that was only visible to him washed over the robot's arm, from the hand to the shoulder of the robot. Suddenly, much to everyone's shock the robot's arm was torn apart completely. The mechanical parts that made the robot's hand, floated in the air before falling to the ground. Izuku let his left arm fall to his side. Putting his right hand in his pocket, he turned and walked towards the orange-haired girl. He turned his head back and saw that the robot was unresponsive before looking back at the girl. Well, that should take care of that, don't you think? W what the hell was that? The orange-haired girl exclaimed. My quirk, Izuku said shortly before giving her a broad smile. My name's Izuku Midoriya, by the way. What's yours? It's a bit too weird to keep calling you the orange-haired girl in my head. Uh. Itsuka Kendo. 
The orange-haired girl introduced herself. Thanks for saving me. Izuku waved his hand dismissively. Nah, it's all right. He tilted his body slightly to look past Itsuka and a large smile bloomed on his face. Hey, it's the feminist from earlier today. The purple-haired girl's face twitched and she whipped her head to the side. Izuku walked toward the girl with Itsuka following behind him. Standing in front of her, he bent his back so that his face was in front of hers. Say, how does it feel like to be saved by a pervert? Izuku asked with a broad smile. It isn't my fault that you were perving on midnight, you dumb green bastard. Izuku laughed harder. Say, say. Purple, what's your name? I am Izuku Midoriya. Juru Kiyoka. The purple-haired girl grumbled in displeasure. Izuku made a shocked face. Wah. You have a girl's name. Why would your parents name you after a girl? You idiot. Juru yelled, throwing a small stone at him, which stopped inches away from him. Suddenly, a sound reached Izuku's ears. He turned to look back only to notice that the robot he had thought was disabled was moving again. It had raised its other arm in the air which then began to spin at such high speed that it sent a huge gust of wind down the street, causing everyone to shield their eyes. Kendo. Take Kiyoka out of here, Izuku said, his voice flat. What? Itsuka looked at Izuku, but what about you? Izuku smirked at her. Hey, Don't worry about me. Take Ms. Feminist over there and get out of here. Itsuka could not decide what to do. On one side, she did not want to leave the boy alone here to face that gigantic robot. On the other hand, she had just seen the boy stop the robot's hand like it was nothing. You could come with us, Itsuka suggested. Izuku glanced at her before staring back at the robot. There's no saying that that robot would leave us alone. We have like another minute to survive and for all we know, even if we run, he pointed at the huge guns installed on the robot, it could start firing with those guns. But if you fight it, you will be disqualified, Itsuka tried to reason. I know. Izuku then turned his head towards her and smiled confidently at her. But I won't be fighting it. All I am doing is defending myself and a few people around me. So, don't worry about me, K. Get yourself to safety. He ended by making shooing motions with his hand. Itsuka realized that there was no point in reasoning with the boy. He wasn't going to listen to her. She glanced once at the robot that was now preparing to attack. Moving fast, she turned and ran toward Jeru. She picked up the girl and put her on her shoulder and began running toward the entrance of the city. Hey, green, Jeru yelled out from her position on Itsuka's shoulder. Izuku turned his head and quirked an eyebrow at her. You better be safe, you bastard. I still have to beat you for being a damn pervert. The purple-haired girl yelled back. Izuku let out an impressed laugh. That girl. He thought shaking his head before giving her a bright smile and a thumbs up. And then the robot's hand came crashing on top of Izuku in the span of a few seconds. Everything nearby was flung away by the shockwaves that were created by the impact of the spinning hand in the ground. Dust and smoke covered the area once again. In the observer's room, the teachers of UA could only watch helplessly as their principal who was about to crush two students under a robot's hand a few seconds ago, had just crushed another student instead. There was no way anyone was going to come out alive of that. And they were 99% sure they were going to be jobless after today. But then, they saw something that filled them with hope. Through the dust and smoke, the cameras showed a shadowy figure of a person. Both Jeru and Itsuka were thrown in the air before they fell harshly to the ground. Both of them instantly spun around and could only stare at the scene in front of them with horror-filled eyes. And no, Jeru whispered, not believing what she saw. You, Ua won't go so far, right? Right. Itsuka could hear the panic in the girl's voice and she could feel herself panicking too. What was happening was just unbelievable. One would expect Ua to take care of their examinee's safety but this was going beyond just testing at this point. Were the students in the other test areas being tested like this too? Then something caught her eyes. She could see the shadowy figure of a person standing. T there. Look, she told Jeru pointing at the shadowy figure. The hell. Did Green survive that? But how? And then, the dust and smoke cleared to show that Izuku was safely standing on one of the fingers of the robot's hand. His hands were on his hip. Head tilted to his left, he stared at the robot's giant red gleaming eye with a smirk. What was more shocking was that there was not a single scratch on his clothes. In fact, there was no scratch on him either. 
It was as if the robot had not just tried to crush the green-haired boy a second ago. I don't know what Yue is thinking, Izuku said, and even though his face had a smirk, his voice was as cold as ice, but, you seem costly. The robot did not respond. Instead, it swung its arm upwards, sending Izuku flying toward the sky. The green-haired menace flipped himself upside down and looked at the giant robot that had just attacked him. The robot had pulled its arm back as if trying to launch another punch at him. But it would never get the chance to do that. Bringing his arms forward, Izuku did the famous Kamehameha pose. A menacing look came on his face. Maximum cursed energy output. The robot stopped moving. It wasn't even shaking. Limitless. The air above the robot's head started to swirl in a spherical motion. In the observer's room, the teachers were on the edges of their sits watching the fight happening in City A. All their eyes were fixed on the swirling ball of air above the robot's head. You guys might want to see this. Powerloader said pointing at a screen that was showing the infrared image of the city. Everyone turned towards the screen and their eyes widened for the umpteenth time that day. The hell, Snipe whispered. Because just above the robot's head, where the normal screens showed a swirling ball of air, the infrared screen showed a blue sphere. Blue. The menacing voice of Izuku was carried to every watcher of the scene in the city. And then, the sound of metal being ripped apart could be heard throughout the city. The next moment, the metal at the top of the robot's head came undone and was pulled upwards defying gravity altogether. One by one, each part of the robot was ripped apart. First the head, then the hand, then the body, and so on. T the hell, one of the candidates, who had been watching, exclaimed as he fell on his butt as he stared at the spectacle. And for the first time since the exam started, the eyes of the examinees portrayed something different from fear and horror. Because, their eyes this time were filled with shock, awe, and fascination. Like everyone else, Itsuka and Jeru were completely flabbergasted by the spectacle. Is this guy even on our level? Was the only question going through everyone's heads. Back in the observer's room, those who were standing fell on their seats and looked at the screen in complete shock. What the hell? Midnight pretty much summarized everyone's thoughts in that sentence. But why was everyone so shocked? Because, right there, floating over City A was a mini moon made of metal scraps. The sphere had to be at least the size of a ten storied building. The giant robot that was just standing there and attacking anyone it saw was no longer present. There was nothing left of the villain bot because every part of the robot was now part of the metal sphere that floated in the sky. If the parts were large, they were compressed to such a degree that they could fit in someone's pocket. Nothing of the robot was spared from the gravitational pull of that sphere. Suddenly, the spherical piece of metal fell to the ground. The sound of metal hitting the earth echoed throughout the city. And then, the sphere itself came undone. Mechanical parts were scattered everywhere from it. Itsuka and Jeru stared at the huge pile of metal scraps that had formed a few feet away from them before Izuku dropped in front of the girls. Yo! He greeted, smiling as if he had not just destroyed a robot that dwarfed every building in the area. Damn green! Jeru groaned. I can already feel a headache incoming. What was that just now? Itsuka asked in shock. Izuku shrugged before smiling. My quirk! Anyways, he began walking away towards the entrance, nice to meet you guys. See you at UA if you guys pass. Time's up. Everyone round up for the medical bots to check up on you. Present Mike's voice resonated throughout the city. Soon, small bots started pouring into the city. Each of them went from student to student, performing checkups and if necessary, some first aids too. Those with more serious injuries were carried by the bots to the medical facility for the doctors to handle. As Jeru was being prepared to be carried to the medical facility, she glanced at Itsuka. Hey, Itsuka? Yes. The orange-haired girl, who was also being prepared to be carried to the facility, responded. Did Green just say that sentence like he was sure he was getting into UA even after all that? I don't know, Itsuka replied blankly, and I don't want to think about any of this anymore. Izuku was currently walking out of UA in the same way he had entered. He had gotten a message from Iida to meet him at Gate 1. Arriving at the spot, he went completely still. He pulled his glasses away from his eyes, pulled out his handkerchief, and wiped the glasses. Rubbing his eyes a little, he put them on only to see that he wasn't hallucinating. Iida was talking to a girl. Well, more like the girl was talking to Iida animatedly while Iida was just standing there looking awkward. 
Suddenly, Ida's eyes found him. Midoriya, finally, you're here. Izuku walked toward the duo and smiled at them. Iida, damn, you got a girlfriend behind my back. Wasn't I enough for you? Izuku looked to the side, pretending to be hurt. The brown haired girl blushed and poked her pointer fingers together. Stop embarrassing me. Iida screamed at Izuku, getting a giggle from the girl. He blushed himself, before coughing into his fist to gain his composure back. Anyway, this is Ochako Uraraka. The brown haired girl bowed. Nice to meet you. Izuku chuckled, before giving a similar bowed greeting. Izuku Midoriya. And it's a pleasure meeting you too. Hey Green. The trio looked behind Izuku to see two girls jogging toward them. Uh, Kyoka and Kendo. You guys are here too. I never got to thank you for saving me, Green. You just ran away. Jeru said as she and Itsuka reached the trio. Nah, it's alright. Midoriya, do you know them? Iida asked looking at Izuku. Yup. Iida, Uraraka, these two are. Izuku was about to introduce them but was interrupted by Jeru. We can introduce ourselves, Green, Jeru said rolling her eyes. Anyways, I am Jeru Kyoka. And I am Itsuka Kendo. Iida Tenya, Iida said, bowing and greeting. Ochako Uraraka. So, do the three of you know each other? Jeru asked, her pointer finger moving from Izuku to Iida to Ochako. Ochako started shaking her hands vehemently. No, no Iida kun just saved me during the exam. Izuku patted Iida's shoulder. Damn, Iida. I see you have taken my teaching to your heart. The way to a girl's heart is to either save her or run your hand through her chest. What kind of dumb teaching is that? Jeru asked in a deadpan. Anime logic, Izuku replied smiling proudly. You sound awfully proud, Jeru said, rolling her eyes mockingly. You won't understand, Izuku waved his hand dismissively before laughing mockingly, you are not a girl. A flying shoe came flying at him only to stop inches away from him. Itsuka looked at the irate purple-haired girl and sighed. Say, Iida interrupted, how did you three meet? Oh, Midoriya Kun saved us from becoming paste, Itsuka said with a blank look on her face. What? Ochako exclaimed. What happened? Well, long story short, Jeru began overcoming her anger at Izuku. I got stuck. Itsuka tried to help me. Then the giant robot we were warned to not go up against, attacked us. Green here saved us and destroyed the robot. Literally made a mini moon over the city, Itsuka added. Wait. Ochako whispered, destroyed. T that robot was H huge. H how did he do that? You would have to ask him, but all he says is that it is his quirk, Jeru replied. Midoriya. Iida was freaking out. You weren't meant to attack the robot, you are going to be disqualified. Izuku looked at him weirdly. Don't tell me even you did not get it? Get what? Itsuka asked raising an eyebrow. Present Mike told us exclusively not to engage the robot first, Izuku lectured raising a finger, but he never warned us from attacking the robot if it attacked first. What? The villain bot attacked you first? Iida was shocked. Yue probably would not let such a blunder happen right. That is something even I am confused about, Izuku replied dryly. Maybe it was some technical failure. Such mistakes aren't something you would expect from Yue, Iida pointed out sternly. Izuku shrugged. Does not really matter. What matters is that the villain bot was going to attack civilians. During the pre-test conference, President Mike compared the villain bot to a real-life villain. Even in real life, we as sidekicks are meant to prioritize civilians over fighting villains, but we are allowed to attack villains if they attack civilians first. Damn. Jeru muttered, impressed by the deduction. That, that does make sense, Itsuka whispered and gave a nod. I, I never thought something like that is possible, Ochako said unbelievingly. Once again you have proven why you are going to be a great hero, Midoriya, Iida cried out, I must continue to learn from you and improve myself. Izuku rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly. Jeru let out a snort of laughter, great hero? This pervert? Why do you say that, Jeru? Ochako asked looking at the girl curiously. Jeru gave Izuku an ominous smirk. Well, you see. Before the exam started, I saw Izuku getting all hot and bothered for Ms. Midnight. What? Iida, Ochako, and Itsuka exclaimed before turning toward Izuku and giving him the stink eye. Midoriya. 
You should not go around doing something so inappropriate with a woman who is older than you. Ieda yelled, his voice projecting his immense disappointment. Why the hell are you guys giving me that stare? Izuku shouted in disgrace. He then pointed at Jiru accusingly. And you, don't go spreading weird rumors about me. Jiru only laughed evilly. I stand by what I said. Fuck you. Cool down, green. Such aggressive behavior is an instant letdown for girls. Izuku huffed before starting to walk away, as if you would know anything about being a girl. Another rock came flying at him which also stopped inches away from him. Soon, he was joined by Ida, Ochako, Jiru, and Itsuka. The girls talked amongst themselves with Ida pitching in sometimes. That day, Izuku Midoriya made three more friends and even gained their phone numbers. That day, for the first time in a very long time, Izuku Midoriya felt alive thanks to the exam where he could let go. That day, Izuku Midoriya took his first step in becoming the symbol of power, hope, and peace. And unknowingly, set his name in the annals of history as the strongest hero to be ever born. No, so, the results are going to be out today. The voice of present Mike echoed through the room. Present Mike, whose real name was Hazashi Yamada, was sitting in a room with his high school friends, Shota Aizawa, also known as Eraserhead, and Namori Kayama, aka Ms. Midnight. I can't believe that kid performed so well, Namori said, looking at the screen displaying the results of the top 10 students. There is a difference of nearly 200 points between first and second place this year. I know, right, Mike agreed. I always thought All Might's record would never be broken, but this kid broke the record by 96 points. What are they even feeding kids these days? Namori wondered. There was another candidate who came really close to crossing 100 points too. Uh huh. Mike nodded. Itsuka Kendo. The girl who saved the purple haired one. I guess this year, we will have a lot of students with the potential to be great heroes. Aizawa looked at the screen with a disinterested look. His eyes went over the names and scores of each participant. 1. Izuku Midoriya 294 points, 186 villain points plus 108 rescue points. 2. Itsuka Kendo 98 points, 45 villain points plus 53 rescue points. 3. Tenya Iida 90 points, 52 villain points plus 48 rescue points. 4. Katsuki Bakugo 77 points, 77 villain points plus 0 rescue points. 5. Ajiro Kirishima 74 points, 39 villain points plus 35 rescue points. 6. Abara Shiyazaki 68 points, 36 villain points plus 32 rescue points. 7. Mezo Shoji 60 points, 30 villain points plus 30 rescue points. 8. Tetsu 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 59 points, 49 villain points plus 10 rescue points. 9. Fumikage Tokiami 57 points, 47 villain points plus 10 rescue points. 10. Ochako Uraraka 50 points, 28 villain points plus 22 hero points. Aizawa wasn't impressed most of the time, but even he had to say that this year's candidates had performed incredibly. Hey Namori, Hizashi began, isn't Midoriya the surname of the new model making quite a name around the modeling industry? Yup, Namori said. Inko Midoriya, if I remember correctly. I am scheduled to sign a new contract for a joint modeling photoshoot with her this weekend. I guess I will ask her then. He is most probably her son. You don't get a lot of people named Midoriya out there. Hizashi said before gesturing at Namori. And what was that with the new principal, Namori? You looked really pissed. Namori let out a frustrated sigh. Ah, that old fart. He told me that my hero costume, she said, making quotation gestures with her hand, is too inappropriate for a school setting and that I should get it changed or resign from teaching. Well, Mike coughed into his fist, he ain't wrong. Your costume leaves too much skin exposed. Just say that she is naked, Aizawa pitched in dryly. Namori slammed her palms on the table. Hey, you bozo. I will let you know that I only intend to familiarize my students with the female body so that no female villain can take advantage of them. And it has nothing to do with your S&M and exhibitionist tendencies? Mike asked dully. Nemory's face turned red in embarrassment. Of course not, you fucking bozos. My, what crude language for a teacher. Mike teased before getting hit by a stapler. Ah. Namori growled and sat down. 
I wish Nezu was still here. Why did that rat have to go and get himself suspended? The new principal seems a little strict, doesn't he? Mike asked nonchalantly. He was appointed by the council board. But apparently, he was a great deal back in his hero days and garnered incredible support. Namori informed. Hazashi scratched his chin. Wonder if he would measure up to Nezu. Aizawa ignored the two in the room. His eyes were focused on one and only one name. Izuku Midoriya. Izuku Midoriya, huh? Aizawa thought to himself. Wonder if you deserve to be on the hero program? And in today's breaking news, the news anchor said, We bring you very shocking news. Izuku Midoriya found himself sitting on the couch in the living room, staring at the television with interest. It was 9 a.m., and for breaking news to drop this early, especially on Hero News, was troubling. Apparently, the principal of UA Hero Academy was found guilty in the case against him, the news anchor announced. Izuku's eyes widened. Okay, something big had happened. And how had he missed something like that? When was a case filed against the principal of UA, and why? For those who don't know, the supporting anchor began speaking, three days ago, an FIR was registered against the principal for endangering the lives of candidates who had been taking the UA entrance exam. A robot went ballistic at the exam site and caused mass panic among the candidates. Because of a brave student, the mess was sorted, and the robot was destroyed. Unfortunately, we have not yet identified who this student is thanks to UA's rather strict guidelines on protecting its candidates' identities. The main anchor then took to the mic and said, The Hero Public Society is also maintaining its silence on the candidates' identities, causing a lot of people to take it negatively as they are not being able to thank the hero of the examination. Izuku released a relieved sigh. He did not want to get hounded by the media and people. He was glad that the president of the HPSC at least had his back in these kinds of cases. Apart from that, a full-on investigation had been launched by the hero safety departments, backed by many politicians, to get to the bottom of this. And it looks like the investigation results reveal that the principal deliberately tried to attack children, risking their lives and nearly killing two. The HPSC has shown disappointment at the principal's actions and has called for law and order to give proper punishment to the principal. The principal has been suspended and is being sued for 100 million yen by the council board of UAA. Chunk of this will go to the candidate who saved the lives of so many students during the exam. We are getting visuals from the principal's quarters. The screen flashed to see the principal of UA being surrounded by police as he was led to a police van. Mr. Nezu, do you regret your actions during the entrance examination? One of the many journalists asked. The mammal looked at the journalist and smiled toothily. I regret nothing. The screen changed to show the two anchors from before. The main anchor began by saying, The principal of UA has been charged with child endangerment, child abuse, and neglect, and is being sentenced to 10 years in prison. Izuku chewed his lips. If the principal of UA was suspended, it meant that the results of the entrance exam would be delayed too. However, the council board has also announced that the candidates will not have to worry about any delay in the results of the entrance exam and that they are going to get their acceptance, rejection letters by today. The main anchor announced it, much to Izuku's relief. Amid this chaos, the supporting anchor started. Good news has come that the candidate that saved the other candidates during the exam has also broken All Might's record of having the highest entrance examination points by 96 points. Izuku felt the muscles in his face twitch. He knew it was only wishful thinking. And he had an idea that the president had deliberately released this information to the media outlets. This is indeed big news, the main anchor said. It is the first time in decades that All Might's score has been broken. And that too by this big a margin. But once again, even after all our inquiries, we don't have any form of information about who this candidate is. But at least we, the people of Japan, have someone to look out for as the next possible All Might. The last statement caused Izuku to release a sigh and smile. He had already gotten confirmation that he had passed the exam and had even scored the highest points in UA's history. I am one step closer to surpassing you, All Might, Izuku thought. He picked up the remote and shut the TV down. Izuku. The green-haired boy's eyes widened, hearing his mother's scream. He rushed towards the exit and threw the door open. Standing near the mailbox was his mother, holding something in her hands. Mom? You all right? Izuku asked, worried that something harmful was inside the mailbox. Inko Midoriya turned towards him with tears streaming down her face. It's here, she exclaimed. 
the result of the entrance exam is here. Izuku's worries went down the drain as a more relieved look came on his face. Oh, he said with a sigh. It was just that. What do you mean it was just that? Inko exclaimed. This is the exam you had prepared for your life. Izuku rolled his eyes. Come on. Grabbing his mother by the hand, he pulled her inside the house. I was worried that we were getting attacked or something. Your scream felt like you were being tortured. Of course, it is torture, Inko retorted angrily. You will never understand that until you are a parent yourself. Izuku smiled at her. I know, he said softly before gesturing for his mother to sit on the couch. He took the object from his mother's hand and examined it. It was a circular disc with the initials UA on it. He flipped it up and down to check if it was a scam but found nothing suspicious. Hitting the power button, the hologram of All Might appeared floating in midair. I am here. The booming voice of All Might came from the hologram. To teach at UA Hero Academy. Huh. All Might is going to teach at UA, Izuku asked himself aloud. The president did not tell me anything about it, though. Young Midoriya, the image of All Might said in his usual booming voice, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on your brave performance during the entrance exam. You defeated the zero pointer and saved the lives of two candidates. What is he talking about, Izuku? Inko asked. Izuku felt himself gulp. He had not told his mother about the incident with the zero pointer. Uh, he is just talking about the small robot trying to attack two girls, and I destroyed it. He answered with a lie. Inko looked at him suspiciously but did not say anything. Your performance in the written exam was outstanding, All Might's figure continued. You scored the highest in the written exam with a 100%. Including you, there was only one other candidate who was able to perform this well in the written exam. However, your performance in your practical exams was what impressed everyone the most. You scored 186 villain points and came extremely close to beating my record with just villain points. But you fought the zero pointer, and for that, we would have taken half of the points away, he paused briefly before continuing, that is if you had attacked it first. But since it attacked you first, there will be no point deduction. And since you even saved the other candidates from it, the judges awarded you 108 rescue points, bringing your total points to 294. A new record in UA's history. So, young Midoriya, welcome to your hero academia. You made a record. Inko exclaimed before grabbing Izuku into a tight hug. Oh. I am so proud of you, Izu-chan. You did it. You got into UA. Izuku laughed heartily. I sure did, mom. Inko let Izuku go and got up. I will start preparing a special dinner for you, sweetheart. With that, the green-haired mother skipped toward the kitchen. Suddenly, Izuku's phone started ringing. He picked up the call and heard the ever-yelling voice of Iida from the other side. Midoriya. Did you get in? Izuku smirked and said, Did you even doubt that I would not get in? Uh, of course. Who am I even asking? Iida retorted. But congratulations on scoring the highest entrance examination points. Thanks, Izuku said, laughing before he paused in realization. Wait. How did you know that I scored the highest? After you told me what you did and knowing you for the last three years, Iida stated matter-of-factly, I don't know anyone else that will be able to top your score this year. Ha ha ha. Izuku laughed. Say, do you know how much Kendo and Kyoka scored? Not really, Iida replied. I haven't talked to them since yesterday. Uh. Should we call them? We can talk to them later. Anyway. Wanna go for a cup of coffee? Sure. Izuku was sitting in front of the president of the HPSC, who was calmly sipping tea from a cup. The president put the cup down and smiled at him. Well, congratulations to the new record holder, the president tried to tease. Izuku gave her a deadpan look. Teasing does not suit you, old lady. The president felt her lips twitch. Who the hell are you calling an old lady, you dumb brat? A. There's only one woman beyond her 90s here, Izuku joked leaning back on his chair. The president's eyebrow twitches. For your information, you dolt, I am in my fifties, and the fifties is the new thirties. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever floats your boat. The president released a frustrated sigh before leaning back on her chair. Still, scoring 294 points in the practical exam wasn't something even I expected from you. A. Hey, really? You underestimate me, Prez. Izuku leaned forward and frowned. But tell me, did you have to release my record-breaking performance to the media? 
The president of the HPSC looked at him weirdly. You are naive if you think something like this would not have leaked to the media. She moved her finger around the cup's rim. And we are living in troubled times. Crimes are increasing in number. And so are criminals. Heroes are dying more frequently. The public is afraid, especially with the fiasco with Nezu. They need something to look forward to. And I gave them just that. She then looked at him. And did not you tell me you want to be a symbol of hope for the people? Consider this your first step to achieving your goal. Izuku's jaws clenched tightly. His hands were joined as he fiddled with his thumbs. You have great powers, Izuku. And remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Did you just quote Uncle Ben? Izuku asked in a deadpan. The president coughed into her fist in embarrassment. How the hell does the brat know about pre quirk comics? She whispered before loudly saying, Whatever, it does not matter. What matters is that you take it seriously from here. You need the UA tag to prove yourself a capable hero in the future. Okay, okay, I get it. I will do my best, Izuku groaned. I am serious, Izuku. That aloof attitude of yours will get you in trouble, the president warned seriously. Come on. Stop worrying so much, Grandma. I will be all right, Izuku sighed. Now tell me about that new principal appointed by UA's council board. The president crossed her arms across her chest. I am afraid I cannot tell you much, but he was popular among the previous generation. It is also the only reason why he was chosen as principal. Are you saying that he is underqualified to be the principal of UA? Compared to Nezu, everyone is underqualified, the president said. I am not saying that the new principal will be bad, it's just that Nezu will always be better. Damn, I did not know you supported Nezu so much. Support Nezu. Definitely not, the president replied casually. It is just that having Nezu out of UA also reduces my chances of keeping an eye on him. Not to mention, having a free Nezu is a disaster. Izuku raised a curious eyebrow. How so? Isn't he going to prison? I thought you would be smarter than this Izuku, the president admonished gently. There are many who owe him a favor. You never know if such a person is guarding him in prison. Never underestimate him in your life. But how is it going to help him? It gives him ample time to go searching for answers about you. If what our investigation has revealed is true, then only the zero pointer in your city went rogue. That is not a coincidence. Nezu willingly set that zero pointer rogue to test you. That means he already suspects something is wrong with your data. If Nezu had been in UA, at least he would have been busy managing the school. But now that he is out of UA, he will have enough time to investigate you. Weren't you the one who wanted to recommend me for UA? Would not that have released information that I am connected to you? That is not what matters to me. If we had recommended you to UA, Nezu would have come here directly to investigate. It means that the playground would have been set up by me. I could have tried to manipulate him away from you most of the time. You are really confident that you could manipulate Nezu? No but I could have bought some time. Don't you think having Nezu on our side would benefit us? He is super intelligent, isn't he? After what happened last time with the spy in several of our departments, I don't feel it's safe to just tell anyone about your quirks. Izuku sighed. It was indeed true. Ten years ago, it was discovered that there had been data leaks from the HPSC about many registered heroes. It had caused quite a scandal back then, with people questioning the loyalty of HPSC. After several months of investigations and raids, nearly 100 employees were found to be leaking data from HPSC servers. The incident provoked heated debates across the country. Unfortunately, who these spies were working for was never found. And since then, the HPSC has increased security to the maximum. Only a few trusted people were allowed to handle the servers. The data about heroes was encrypted even more tightly. A no-nonsense approach was taken by the newly appointed president. Every step was taken to ensure that no such incident would take place in the future. Izuku pushed himself off the seat. I should go. I have to prepare for the final exams. With that, he walked to the door. Izuku. The green-haired boy stopped and looked back. Here. The president threw something toward him. Izuku caught the object and looked at it before a smile came to his face. It was a sunglasses case. Opening it, he saw the latest model from Hero Glass, the best sunglasses brand. Think of it as a present for passing. The president said this, sipping tea from her cup. I am expecting great things from you, Izuku. Try not to disappoint me. Oh, 
and the amount of money we received from Nezu will be transferred to your mother's bank account. Hope you have not lied to your mother about the incident. Three months later, Izuku was in his room, making last-minute preparations. He checked to see if he had taken everything or not. Once done, he walked to the mirror to check himself over. He had grown two inches in the last three months, making him five feet nine inches tall. Being this tall at just fifteen years old was a blessing for someone of Asian descent. And he still had three more years to grow. If his height increased at this rate, by the end of his eighteenth birthday, he would stand at six feet five inches. Yue had sent their uniform a week ago through the parcel. It was a light gray blazer with dark turquoise trimmings over a white shirt, dark blue pants, and a red tie that Izuku had not tied properly, leaving it much shorter than it should have been. And to finish the uniform, he wore red shoes. His middle school final exams were done and dusted. And as everyone had expected, Izuku had scored the perfect score and passed as the top student in school. For someone else, it would have been an achievement. But for Izuku, it was just a cakewalk. He then walked to the front door, where he saw his mother standing. Have you taken everything? She asked. Yes, mom. I have. Your pencil box? Yes. Your lunch box? Yes. Your student ID card? Yes. Your mom. Izuku interrupted her. Don't worry. I have everything here. He told her, pointing at his backpack. Inko felt tears well up in her eyes as she watched her precious jewel stand at the doorway wearing the uniform of Japan's most prestigious hero school. The uniform suited him so well. When she looked at him, she remembered holding him in her arms while he cried himself to sleep. I will be going now, mom, Izuku said, heading out of the house. Izuku. The green-haired boy stopped outside the doorway and looked back at his mother. Best of luck out there, Izu-chan, Inko said as she wiped her tears. Izuku gave her his brightest smile and replied, Thanks, mom. He closed the door and walked away toward his destination. Izuku was rushing through the halls of UA, trying to find his classroom. Iida had called him 30 minutes ago, informing him that he was already at UA. Either the boy could not contain his excitement to visit UA, or it was just his usual self trying to reach a destination two hours before the scheduled time. And knowing Iida for as long as he had, Izuku was sure to bet on the second option. But he was late. He was sure that he would have reached his classroom ten minutes before homeroom started. But he had not anticipated UA to be a maze-like structure, and that damn president had not found it necessary to tell him that. When he entered the school, he assumed they would have directions leading them to their classes. Finding the auditorium during the entrance exam was easy because the auditorium's directions were mentioned on a board. But why weren't there directions for classrooms? He had been wandering around the school for thirty minutes, trying to find his classroom. And interestingly, he had found the washroom, the laboratory, the school canteen, the library, the principal's office, the teacher's room, and even the gymnasium. But for the love of All Might's rabbit like spikes, he could not find his classroom. And now he had five minutes left before homeroom started, and still, he wasn't sure where his classroom was. Just as he turned a corner, he crashed into someone, making him halt abruptly. Izuku was shocked, but in his hurry to find his class, he had completely missed the presence of someone coming from the side, causing whoever it was to fall to the ground on their butt. Ah! A pain-filled feminine voice came from across from him. Izuku looked at the person on the floor to see a black-haired girl rubbing her head. Her school bag lay to her left on the ground while she sat sprawled. I, I am extremely sorry, miss. Izuku apologized in a kind tone. And no, it's all right, the black-haired girl said, trying to stand up. I should not have run in the hallway. Here, let me help you, Izuku said, offering his hand. The black haired teen accepted it gratefully as Izuku gently pulled her up. As the girl dusted her skirt, Izuku collected her school bag and handed it to her. The black haired girl thanked him and bowed in apology. Please, forgive me for crashing into you. I am in a hurry. Izuku laughed it off and waved his hand dismissively. It's all right. If anything, I should be the one to be sorry. I was running in the hallway. He turned around and was about to run off when he remembered something. Say, you would not know where the 1A classroom is, would you? The girl's eyes widened in surprise before she smiled at him. I know where it is. In fact, I am heading right there. You can follow me if you want. She pointed her thumb behind her. It is in that direction, past two classrooms. Izuku quirked an eyebrow at her before shrugging. Sure. Lead the way. 
The girl smiled. Turning around, she began walking in the direction she had pointed, with Izuku following behind her. Say, are you in class 1A2? Izuku asked with curiosity. Yes, I am. My name is Momo Yaoyorozu. It is a pleasure to meet you. The black haired girl introduced herself. Izuku Midoriya. And the pleasure is all mine. The two of them walked in silence toward the classroom. Izuku stared at Momo. She possessed a grace not found in other girls. The way she walked told Izuku that she belonged to a high class family. As he looked at her with his ocular quirk, her skin lit up from the inside, telling him that whatever her quirk was, it was related to something under her skin. Maybe it was her muscles. He was tempted to ask her but decided against it because it would be awkward to do so during their first meeting. He remembered his first attempt to strike up a conversation with Ieda. Minor flashback. So, is an engine inside your leg, or is your leg an engine? Or are you a robot, like the Terminator? Maybe Optimus Prime? Are you a car? I am sorry? Minor flashback end. God bless that Ieda had not taken that the wrong way. It was impolite to ask those questions to someone you had met for the first time. And since then, he had stopped asking people about their quirks openly. He just wished that his ocular powers could decipher quirks on a deeper level. He hoped that one day, after mastering his six eyes, he would simply look at someone and tell what their quirks were. It would be so awesome. By the way, how did you know the way to the classroom? Izuku asked. I ran around the school for half an hour and still could not find the classroom. Oh. It was actually a senior who told me the way, Momo said. Ah, oh, I guess that makes sense. Here we are, Momo said stopping before a giant door. Both craned their necks upward and stared at the door with impressed looks. Izuku let out a whistle. Damn. Wonder if they make it for students with giant mutation quirks? Most probably, Momo answered as she slid the door open and was immediately blasted with the loud noise of students chattering. And a soundproof room? UA does not play around, does it? Izuku wondered aloud, with Momo nodding her head in agreement. However, the sound of the door sliding open caught the attention of the whole classroom. The entire class stared at the duo standing at the door. Midoriya. The boisterous voice of Ieda rebounded through the room as the blue-haired boy appeared in front of Izuku. You're finally here. I thought that you were going to be late again. Come on, Ieda. Izuku groaned. Give me some slack, will you? The school is a fucking maze. Maze? Ieda asked, raising an eyebrow. All you had to do was climb two floors and turn right. How can you get lost? It was that easy? Who the hell told you about that? The man standing at the entrance gate. That man was not a security guard. Ieda slapped his forehead in exasperation. No, Midoriya, he wasn't. Momo giggled from the side, listening to the two boys talk. Yo, green. Momo looked forward and noticed a girl with short purple hair and long earlobes shaped like audio jacks walking towards them with an arm raised in greeting. Ah, Jeru. Izuku greeted with a smile. You passed too. Jeru felt her eyebrows twitch in annoyance. What the hell does that mean, you bastard? Her eyes then noticed Momo, and they began sparkling. She rushed over to her side and wrapped an arm around the raven haired girl, shocking the latter. Who is this, Green? Your girlfriend. Momo felt a blush come on her face. And know why you're mistaken, Miss Jeru. Miss Jeru? Jeru asked, looking at her incredulously. Girl. No need to be so uptight. We are all friends here. Call me Kyoka. Momo finally got control of her blush. S sure. I am Momo Yaoyorozu. But you can call me Momo if you want. Yaoyorozu? Are you related to someone from the Yaoyorozu Corporation? Momo averted her eyes and tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. Ah, Izuku grabbed his chin in thought. Now I realize why your name felt so familiar. Well, my father owns the Yaoyorozu Corporation, Momo said sadly. Now they will judge me and call me pompous because of my family name. Jeru let out an impressed whistle. Damn, girl. Thought so. Momo thought dejectedly, only to be surprised by the girl's following words. No doubt you appeared so uptight. Jeru continued, but don't worry. I will whip that uptightness out of you in no time. She is right. Yano, Izuku said with a bright smile before pointing at Ieda with his thumb. I mean, this guy here was so stiff that there was no difference between him and a robot. But look at him now. 
a few months with me, and we were both hijacking cars. Don't spread your weird ideas to others, you dolt. Iida reprimanded, gritting his teeth. Who gave you permission to help anyway, Green? Jeru asked with a disgusted look on her face. What? Izuku felt his lips twitch. Jeru leaned closer to Momo's ears and whispered, Let me warn you, girl. This guy is pure evil. This guy goes from street to street and pretends to be All Might's son. Momo covered her mouth with her hands, giving him a shocked look. Oh my, she whispered in wonder. Don't spread these rumors, damn it. Izuku yelled uncharacteristically before pointing at Momo. And don't be so gullible as to believe anything she says. Jeru stuck her tongue out at him playfully while Momo giggled at their antics. Hey. You guys are here too. Izuku looked behind him to see Ochako and Kendo walking toward the class. Hey. You guys are in this class too. Izuku greeted happily. Guess the whole gang is complete, huh? What gang? Jeru deadpanned at him but was ignored by the green haired boy. The school is so big, Ochako said. I could not even find the way to the class. I would have missed the orientation if I had not stumbled on Itsuka. Itsuka smiled at her. It's all right. I would have also arrived late if I had not met the senior on the way. See, I am not the only one who lost their way, Izuku told Iida, who pretended not to listen to him. Just then, Izuku felt someone's presence behind him. He looked back to see a yellow cocoon lying on the ground. He scrunched his eyes and noticed that it was actually a person inside a yellow sleeping bag with his face poking out of the bag. By then the group standing at the doorway had noticed the strange object as well. Is that a cocoon? Ochako asked curiously. It took you guys 10 seconds to notice me, the person inside the sleeping bag said. One of his arms came out of the sleeping bag carrying a juice box which he sipped soundly. Get to your seats before I expel the whole class. The group standing at the doorway all scrambled their way to their seats. Each bench had the name of the student sitting on it. Izuku was allotted seat number 19, the second last bench in the class. He found himself seated behind Kendo and before Momo. The man in the sleeping bag unzipped it and stepped out. He walked to the front of the class, where a podium was built, and stood quietly. Izuku raised an eyebrow, noticing the familiar figure of Eraserhead, whom he had met the day he had awakened his quirks. Only he looked older and much more tired than all those years ago. It looked like the man was being driven to the bone by his hero job. Slowly, the class noticed him and quieted down. The man glanced at a stopwatch and hummed in what sounded like disappointment. It took you brats eight seconds to notice me and another five seconds to quiet down, the eraser head said. Disappointing to see the supposed future heroes being so slow to react to the presence of an unknown amongst them. By the way, my name is Shota Aizawa. The class gulped in fear. You guys have orientation in five minutes, Eraserhead continued. If I were anyone else, I would take you to the auditorium, but unfortunately, I am your homeroom teacher, and I hate wasting time pointlessly. UA offers its teachers a free form style of education, and I tend to use its benefits to the fullest. The homeroom teacher moved away from the podium and stood in one corner. He pulled out a remote. Pressing a button, the green board lit up with a presentation. Today is your first day of school. Four months from now, the sports festival will be held. The country's largest competition, with a viewership second only to the International Hero Championship. It also allows you to be scouted by various heroes and gain valuable field experience. After that, you will have a one-month internship with a hero who has scouted you during the sports festival. Four months from then, you will have your hero license exams, and if you pass, you will receive your provisional license to be a hero. Three months later, you will have your final exams. That was all you needed to know for the orientation program. The man clicked another button on the remote, and the presentation turned off. He then pointed the remote at the bank of lockers at the back of the classroom and pressed another button. The lockers unlocked and slid forward. The locker with your seat number is also your personal locker, the pro hero said as he walked up to the podium. He then picked up a gym suit. You will find gym uniforms like this one, he said, gesturing at the uniform in his hand. Go get dressed, and meet me at the training ground in 10 minutes. Anyone late will find themselves out of the hero course faster than they can blink. You will find the changing rooms at the end of this floor. With that, he left the classroom. Everyone started panicking as they hurried to their lockers and picked up their gym clothes before rushing towards the changing room. While Izuku would have taken it slow, he did not want to test Eraserhead's patience. 
So, he too found himself dashing towards the changing room, but much more casually than others. The first one out of the dressing room and onto the training ground was Izuku. He noticed Aizawa standing there with his stopwatch. As Izuku reached Aizawa, he raised an arm in greeting. Hey, Mr. Aizawa, long time no see. Aizawa stared at Izuku with an air of disinterest before glancing down at the stopwatch. Six minutes. I expected better. Izuku felt the muscles in his face twitch. Anyway, how are you doing? I would suggest you quiet down, Midoriya. This is not a playground but a school. Aizawa scolded. Izuku felt miffed, and he frowned. Did I do something to get him angry or something? Izuku thought, unable to understand why Aizawa was being so strict. He shrugged, attributing it to the man's personality, and decided to joke less. Soon, the Class 1A students piled up on the training ground. Aizawa ran his eyes over them before glancing at the stopwatch. Nine minutes. Good, but can be better. Mr. Aizawa, Ochako called out, raising an arm. Yes? What are we doing here? Aizawa hummed before nodding. I will be testing your quirks to get an idea of the areas you need to improve on. Mr. Aizawa, how are you going to do that? Iida asked. Aizawa then pulled up a screen and displayed it to the class. Middle school physical examination. Middle school physical examination. A red-haired boy asked. The whole class was confused and waited for Aizawa to explain further. Aizawa continued explaining. Softball throwing, standing long jumps, 50-meter dash, endurance running, grip strength, side-to-side -side steppings, upper body training, and seated toe touch. You have all done these in the middle school, right? But for some irrational reason, our education system forbids schools from allowing children to use their quirks during these examinations. The pro hero glanced at Izuku. Midoriya. You scored the most during the entrance exam. How far could you throw a softball in middle school? Izuku scratched his chin in thought before saying, 200 meters. 200 meters. The whole class, besides Iida, exclaimed in fascination. To think that someone could throw that far without even using their quirk. Aizawa pointed at the circle. Walk up to the circle and throw this ball. The pro hero threw a ball at Izuku, which stopped a few inches away from him. As Izuku walked toward the circle, the ball floated with him. He could feel Aizawa's eyes on him. He knew this was his chance to impress a hero he had admired for so long. Stepping into the circle, Izuku placed his left palm under the floating ball and let the ball fall to his hand. Transferring the ball to his other hand, he reinforced it with cursed energy. The green-haired boy then took a pitching position. Using laps, he threw the ball as hard as he could. There was a loud explosion as the ball broke the sound barrier and disappeared from view. Izuku smirked as dust and smoke covered the ground. A few seconds later, the machine in Aizawa's hand beeped. Aizawa looked at the machine, and his eyes widened just for a moment before settling back into their tired look. He then showed the class the machine. The distance calculator showed 2,879.95 meters, 3 kilometers. A boy with spiky blonde hair exclaimed in disbelief. How the hell do you beat that? Aizawa ignored the boy and said, this is what you are capable of achieving when you use your quirk. Midoriya's score increased ten times. You all will be going through these simple tests. Whoa! A pink-skinned girl exclaimed joyfully. We will be able to use our quirks. This is going to be fun. Aizawa's eyes narrowed dangerously as he stared at the girl. Fun, you say? So, why don't we make it a little more fun? Whoever comes last will be expelled. What? But Mr. Aizawa. Ochako protested, it isn't fair. We all passed the entrance exam to get selected for the hero course. How interesting. Aizawa drawled. You want me to be fair? Tell me, when is anything fair in life? Natural disasters, rampaging villains. How are these fair? UA has prided itself on producing the best out of the best heroes. If you thought that by just entering UA you would all be automatically entitled to a pro hero, then I am sorry to burst your bubble because the next three years are going to be hell on earth for you brats. Aizawa started walking away toward another spot. Use your strength to overcome the hurdles in front of you. That's plus ultra, right? Guess. This is what they call a trial by fire, Iida whispered to Izuku, who nodded in agreement. 50 meter dash Izuku was impressed by his classmates. Iida was the first to be called for the event, 
and he was up against a girl with a frog type mutation quirk. He had crossed the finish line in 2.45 seconds. It looked like Ieda was training his quirk as much as possible. The girl he was competing against finished the race in 5.58 seconds, which was impressive. Ochako had used her quirk to lighten her clothes, shoes, and herself, allowing her to finish the event in 7 seconds. Kendo and Kyoka had performed better than expected, as their quirks were unsuitable for such an event. Both had finished the event in under 7 seconds, showing their impressive fitness. However, the most impressive was Momo. He was shocked when she turned around and unbuttoned her jacket. But he was immediately impressed when she produced a pair of skates. The brief moment when she used her quirk allowed him to scan her with his eyes. That had revealed that she could alter the atoms of her fat molecules to produce anything she wanted. But to produce something by altering atoms at that level required an extensive understanding of the atomic structure of that thing. This fact made him respect his classmate even more. Finally, it was his turn. His opponent was a boy with dual colored hair, with one side red and the other white. He also had a scar on the left side of his face. His face was stoic, and his eyes burning with determination. Izuku took his position beside the boy and did a few stretches before interlacing his fingers together while keeping his palms a few inches away from each other. Just as Aizawa blew the whistle, Izuku slapped his palms together and teleported to the other end of the track. The machine at the end beeped and said, 0.00001 seconds. Shock-filled cries erupted on the grounds as the machine declared the time. The dual-haired boy's eyes were wide in shock as he used ice to slide to the finish line. Izuku walked back to his friends while laughing at their shocked faces, all but Ieda, who cried and vowed to improve even more the next time. The only person who was not shocked was Aizawa. The pro hero had seen Izuku use his teleportation powers in the entrance examination. So he was less shocked. However, he was staring at Izuku with narrowed eyes. Izuku's uncaring attitude was rubbing the wrong way on him. Grip strength The next event was grip strength. On a raw strength basis, the most impressive was Mezo Shoji, who scored 540 kg. Momo had once again demonstrated her quirk's versatility and creativity by designing a pair of gloves with hydraulic pistons attached to them. It had increased her grip strength, allowing her to score 400 kg. Next was Kendo, who had scored an impressive 350 kg. Ochako and Jiru had not performed well in grip strength, with Ochako scoring 75 kg and Jiru scoring 76 kg. Ida had somehow scored 100 kg, which was impressive in itself. When Izuku's turn came, he simply floated the device above his hand. With a smirk on his face, he applied blue around the device's grip before crushing it completely. The device beeped loudly and displayed 999.99 kilograms. Once again, the entire class was shocked by the result. How could someone's quirk be that powerful? The next few events went like the earlier ones, with Izuku pretty much cakewalking through them. During the endurance running test, Izuku outran everyone in the class by an hour. In second place was Momo Yaoyorozu, who had created a kick scooter for the test. The boy with the dual hair had come third with him sliding on ice. Iida had come in fourth, with Shoji following close behind. The frog like girl had outperformed Itsuka, Jiru, and Ochako. In the side to side steppings, a boy with balls on his head used them to bounce himself back and forth. Izuku had once again used his teleportation abilities to teleport from left to right, but the repeated teleportations had made him dizzy, causing him to falter and finish second. The next event was a standing long jump. Ochako had shown her creativity by making herself nearly weightless and crossing the whole sand pit in one jump. Another impressive performer was a blonde boy shooting a beam from his navel. When it was Izuku's turn, he simply activated his infinity and floated across the sand pit. The class was called for the softball throw, and Ochako had outperformed him by using her quirk to send the ball into space. The device had even displayed the infinity sign. Momo created a cannon with her quirk and used it to throw the ball 2019 meters away. Kendo had come in fourth place by displaying her impressive strength and throwing the ball 500 meters away. In fifth place was the dual haired boy, and in sixth place was the boy with octopus arms. Finally, the class huddled together before Aizawa. Beside the pro hero was the robot that was announcing the student's score. These tests were to see how familiar you were with your quirks, and I must say, I am impressed with most of you, Aizawa said in a bored tone. All of you have performed well. And as for the standings. 
The head of the robot glowed, and a holographic screen appeared above it displaying the rankings. 1. Izuku Midoriya 2. Momo Yaoyorozu 3. Shoto Todoroki. 4. Itsuka Kendo 5. Tenya Iida 6. Mezo Shoji 7. Fumikage Tokiami. 8. Mashirao Ojiro 9. Ajiro Kirishima 10. Mina Ishido. 11. Ochako Uraraka 12. Koji Koda 13. Ricardo Sato 14. Suyu Asui. 15. Kiyoka Jiru 16. Yuga Aoyama 17. Hanta Siro 18. Denki Kaminari. 19. Toru Hagakuri 20. Minoru Mineta, as I said, Aizawa continued, a lot of you have performed well, and some need to improve. He then glanced at the class. Midoriya and Todoroki. Step forward, he called. Izuku tilted his head confused, as he noticed the dual-haired boy walk to the front. He shrugged before walking and standing beside the dual-haired boy. As I told everyone, Aizawa began in his usual bored tone. UA gives its teachers a lot of freedom in what they want to do in class and what students they want to teach. So, from here on out, the two of you are expelled from the hero course. Izuku stared at the three underground heroes through his sunglasses. It was his monthly examination where the Hero Public Safety Council had him fight an underground hero. The underground heroes was a group started by the HPSC to monitor illegal proceedings in the country. As far as Izuku was aware, the HPSC had made a mistake in the past and hence had recruited heroes who were passionate about saving people from the shadows. They weren't much for publicity and hence made the best candidates to discover drug dealers and other illegal dealers. Izuku wasn't sure, but he had heard rumors that someone mysterious spearheaded this group. Someone whose data was only available to the HPSC president and vice president. This person's identity sure made Izuku curious. The green-haired boy felt someone enter his range and then stand beside him. He turned his head to the right and saw Yukimaru standing there. Are you ready, Izuku? Yukimaru asked gently. Um, do do I really need to fight them all together? Izuku asked nervously. Yukimaru nodded his head. Yes, you do, Izuku. You have the potential to be a great hero, but your lack of confidence in yourself is impacting your abilities. Be but? Is fighting three heroes together the solution? Izuku asked. This time Yukimaru shook his head negatively. No, it isn't. And that's why we are asking you to do this. If you win this, you know that you're better. What if I, uh, what if I lose? Yukimaru shrugged his shoulders. Then we can have one hell of a training month and then you fight five guys together next month. Izuku felt himself gulp in fear. So, if I lose, the number of opponents increase by two every month. Yukimaru simply nodded. And if I win, they remain the same? No they increase by four. You uh, anyway, I am sure you're going to come out on top, Yukimaru said, as he started walking towards the three heroes. Good luck, Izuku. Yukimaru walked up to the three heroes that he had chosen for this test. One of them saw him approaching and raised a hand in greeting. Yo, Yuki. What is this all about? Yukimaru stopped before them and addressed the hero nonchalantly. Did not I tell you three that you will evaluate someone? Yeah, you did, a hero with a dark skin replied, but where is this mysterious trainee that we need to evaluate? Yukimaru raised an eyebrow and pointed a thumb behind his back at Izuku. You are evaluating him. The three heroes looked behind him at Izuku, then back at him, and then again at Izuku. Wait. Wait. You want us to evaluate a kid? The dark skinned man asked incredulously. I mean, I can understand killing drug lords and all that, but fighting a kid, the last hero mumbled audibly. How old is he anyway? 10? 12? He is 8. Yukimaru said firmly. The first hero's eyebrow twitched. Yuki, with all due respect, how are we supposed to fight a child? Yukimaru rolled his eyes. Don't think. Just fight him. And a piece of advice. Don't underestimate the kid. With that, Yukimaru walked out of the chamber. The three heroes stared at Yukimaru's back before turning toward their opponent. A literal child who was shaking in nervousness. How could someone be so cruel to force a child fight three grown and experienced heroes? The child was weird. He had spiky green hair, freckles on his cheek and wore a sunglass even in the dark chambers. By no means did the child look anything special. 
and the way the child was fidgeting in nervousness caused their hearts to go out for the kid. Maybe they could smuggle the kid out of the HPSC and have the kid live a normal life? Uh, um, H hello. M my name is Izuku Midoriya. It's a pleasure to meet you, Izuku greeted and shyly bowed. Izuku's politeness brought a smile to the hero's face. The first hero waved and introduced himself. Hey there, kid. The name's Yukushi and I doubt you'd know my hero name. He finished with a chuckle. The second hero, the dark-skinned man, smirked while introducing himself, and I am Toshi. The third hero smiled softly and said, I am Tenzu. If the introductions are done, Yukimaru's voice echoed through the chamber, drawing the eyes of the four toward the observation room visible through a glass. You should begin the evaluation. Tashi's eyes left Yukimaru before releasing a sigh. Guess, we will have to do this anyway. Let's be gentle with the kid and be done with it. He then looked at his fellow heroes. You guys won't mind if I go first, will you? Yukushi and Tenzu shook their head negatively. Not at all, Tenzu said. Toshi stepped forward. All right kid, I will go easy on you. I don't know what quirk you have. So, I hope you're ready for this. Um, sure, Izuku said, hesitantly. Toshi curled both of his hands into fists and brought his fists five inches apart from each other. All right, kid. Here I come. And then, he collided both of his fists together as gently as possible. Bomb. The gentle collision created a loud sound directed toward Izuku who did not have time to react properly and was forced to bear the brunt of the sound attack. Izuku screamed in agony as his ears were forced open by the loudness of the sound. He collapsed on his knees while grabbing his ears with his hands. Shit. Yukushi cursed as he rushed toward Izuku. Damn it Toshi. Why did you use such a loud sound? That was the softest sound that I can produce, Toshi said as he too rushed toward Izuku. When Yukushi reached the boy, he knelt beside him and tried to touch him only to find his hand stopping two inches away from the boy. Huh? He muttered as he tried to take his hand away but was unable to do so. Yukushi. Is he alright? Toshi asked. I. I don't know. What do you mean? I can't touch him. What? Toshi stopped behind Yukushi and noticed that indeed Yukushi's hand was stopping inches away from Izuku's face. Is that his quirk? Izuku Midoriya, Yukimaru's voice echoed through the chamber once again, I thought you were better than that. Izuku shook his head. I I am, I just miscalculated. Then, show these heroes what you're capable of Izuku. S sure, the boy said as he raised an arm and pointed his palm at something behind Yukushi. Both Yukushi and Toshi turned their heads in that direction but saw that no one was there. Not even Tenzu. They turned their head back toward Izuku and were about to question him when suddenly. Technique lapse, Izuku whispered, blue. Suddenly, both the heroes felt a pull and a second later they were harshly dragged away from Izuku by an invisible force. The two of them continued until they crashed into the wall of the chamber. Yukushi let out a groan of pain at being hit so hard and he opened an eye. He noticed that Izuku had stood up and took a fighting stance. I I am sorry I if I hurt you. B but, I don't want to lose, the boy said, shyly. What the hell is going on, Yukushi, Toshi asked groaning and rubbing the back of his head. Yukushi slowly pushed himself onto his feet. I think that was his quirk. Wait. Wait. What is his quirk? Toshi asked getting onto his feet too. Is it a barrier, or is it some form of pulling? Well, Yukushi said, staring at Izuku with a frown. That's the question, isn't it? Hope Tenzu can find an answer. Tenzu, who had disappeared from before, blended himself with the air. Tenzu's quirk was called, air shape, where it allowed him to change his body molecules into oxygen molecules and disperse in air. His quirk was one of the most versatile because he could use the surrounding oxygen molecules to recreate the molecules of his body, thus giving him infinite regeneration. When Toshi had first stepped up, Tenzu had quietly dispersed his body molecules into the air. He kept his eyes intact so that he could observe the proceedings. At first, when Toshi's attack made Izuku scream in agony, Tenzu had thought that the fight was over and that he wasn't required. But then, the boy had shown his quirk by throwing Toshi and Yukushi away from him. Just when Izuku threw Toshi and Yukushi were away, Tenzu made his move. He appeared behind Izuku and attempted to grab the boy in his arms. But surprise took him when Izuku's head snapped back, his green eyes glowing with an unknown intensity behind those glasses. 
Before Tenzu could grab Izuku, Izuku dodged by ducking down. The boy then placed both of his hands on the ground and used it to push himself into the air, allowing him to do a spin kick at Tenzu. But Tenzu immediately responded by dispersing his lower body into the air, causing Izuku's kick to fly past him. Taking the opportunity, Izuku pushed himself away from Tenzu, whose head was floating in the air. Izuku stared at Tenzu, his eyes telling him that whatever Tenzu's quirk was, they related it to air. So, in an experiment, Izuku brought both of his hands up and pointed at Tenzu. Blue, Izuku whispered as an invisible sphere appeared in front of Tenzu's head. Tenzu's eyes widened when something invisible started pulling his body molecules in. He tried to get away by dispersing his body into oxygen molecules, but the force did not allow the molecules to escape. Izuku was about to increase the output of his technique, which would cause the pull of blue even stronger, but was interrupted when the concrete below him just disappeared. Because of that, he lost his balance and his concentration on blue, allowing Tenzu to escape. Izuku huffed when his senses told him that someone had appeared behind him. He reacted quickly and turned around to see Yukushi with his hands covered in concrete, trying to grab him. Bending his knees a little, Izuku pushed himself away just as Yukushi's hand made for the grab. But Toshi appeared soundlessly to Izuku's left, his hands curled into fists and nine inches away from each other. Without wasting time, Toshi bumped his fists together sending a louder sound wave at Izuku. Izuku in return formed the half ram symbol with his left hand activating the neutral aspect of his quirk. The sound waves did reach Izuku but stopped just a few inches away from him. The effect could be seen because the impact of the sound waves with neutral limitless created a triangular crevice. Izuku then joined his fingers together and clasped his palms together, teleporting behind Toshi. There he threw a hard punch that connected with Toshi's right side and sent the sound hero hurling toward Yukushi. Yukushi, however, managed to grab Toshi in his arms but the force with which Toshi was thrown caused him to skid a few meters back. Tenzu, who was watching all this, decided to act again. He dispersed his body into oxygen molecules and surrounded the green-haired boy with them. Give up, Midoriya. Tenzu warned. This can become ugly if we continue. I can ignite the oxygen molecules. Izuku gulped but clasped his hands together. I, I am sorry, but I don't like losing, he said and teleported a few feet away. He then pointed his palm at Tenzu who was floating in his initial place and activated blue there. It caused Tenzu's molecules to be sucked into the sphere mercilessly. Izuku just hoped that when he dropped blue, Tenzu would be fine. But once again his senses went haywire and he looked down. Suddenly, the ground beneath him exploded and a loud sound impacted his ears. Izuku's eyes were shut in pain but he managed to open his eyes a little and saw that Toshi was bent over a hole in the ground while Yukushi had his hands on the ground. Izuku spun himself in mid-air and pointed his palm at the duo trying to activate blue again but Toshi was faster and sent another sound wave toward Izuku by bumping his fists together. Izuku was able to activate neutral limitless and managed to stop the sound waves from affecting him. But what he had not expected was that the explosion from before was not a simple explosion. The concrete that had been exploded away coalesced together to form a hand and tried to grab Izuku. Izuku, who was starting to get irritated at this point, closed his palms together teleporting behind the two heroes. Toshi turned back but was late as Izuku's fist connected with his stomach with enough force to send him hurling away at the opposite wall. Yukushi seeing Toshi being punched away went to grab Izuku with his concrete arms but Izuku dodged the grab and proceeded to throw a punch at Yukushi's arm that tried to grab Izuku. The punch was strong enough to cause the concrete coating Yukushi's arm to crack and be destroyed. Yukushi tried to grab Izuku with his other arm but Izuku dodged it too and punched it, breaking it too. Izuku did not waste another second and punched Yukushi in the stomach, sending him flying into Toshi. Well done. Izuku, Yukimaru's voice rang through the chamber. As Izuku retracted his fist, he was amazed that he had managed to take down not one but three heroes at the same time. He raised his right fist to his chest level and stared at it with wide and odd eyes. Maybe he could become like All Might. Perhaps he had the strength to surpass the symbol of peace. In that moment, Izuku was lost in his own world. A world where he was at the top and everyone was looking at him with hope. Just like this world did with All Might. So lost in his world, he did not even notice Yukimaru enter the chamber or the other heroes all start to surround him. The hell Yuki, Yukushi said, groaning and massaging his swelling head, 
What are you feeding this kid? Yeah. Toshi groaned, crossing his arms over his chest. This kid is way too strong. Tenzu just nodded his head. Yukimaru gave them a smirk. I told you, did I not? Don't underestimate the kid. You guys did not go all out against the kid. Maybe then you would have a chance. Tashi's eyebrows knitted in a worried frown. But still, having three grown heroes going all out on a kid does not seem right. You know it is against our morals, right? Yukimaru released a deep breath. I know. But I told you that specifically because Izuku has fought heroes and the trainees that we have here before in a one versus one and he has always come out on top. Yukimaru then turned his head and looked at the small green haired boy. You want to know something interesting about the kid? Yukushi shrugged his shoulders and said, Sure. Why not? Izuku has yet to fail in any task that we have given him. Whether it was any academic test or any physical test, Izuku Midoriya has never failed before. Toshi raised an eyebrow questioningly. You for real? Yukimaru nodded. So, you guys are dealing with a genius, huh? No wonder you had such confidence in the boy, Yukushi murmured begrudgingly. Indeed, Yukimaru touched the boy's shoulder and shook him gently. Midoriya, Midoriya. Midoriya. Izuku's eyes snapped open as he felt someone jerk his body. He felt someone's hand on his right shoulder. He moved his head in that direction and noticed the black-haired girl he had met on his way to class earlier. Uh. It's you, Yaoyorozu, Izuku said. I must have dozed off, he thought in his head. The green-haired boy was sitting on a seat in the cafeteria. He wondered how long he had been here now. He glanced to his right where Yaoyorozu took a seat beside him. Mr. Midoriya, are you alright? Momo asked in concern. Izuku turned his head toward her and looked at her questioningly. Huh? Why won't I be? Momo averted her eyes and said lowly, you are crying. What? Izuku asked in shock. His left hand instinctively rose up to his left cheek and he was shocked when he felt a trail of wetness on his cheek. Have I really been crying? What happened to me? First that weird dream from my past and now this. He was a little rattled but he outwardly smiled broadly. Nah. I think something went into my eye or something. Momo looked at him in worry but did not voice her concern. The events of the examination had rattled everyone in the class. Everyone was shocked when Aizawa sensei had decided to expel not the last student but two of the top three students from his class. Aizawa's decision made no sense to Momo. She had tried her best to think of a reason why Mr. Aizawa would do something like that. Todoroki was an excellent performer in the evaluation. He was physically fit and had one of the strongest quirks in their class. And then there was Midoriya, who had to be the strongest student in their class. Midoriya had dominated the physical evaluation. Yet, Mr. Aizawa had decided to expel both of his strongest students. It confused Momo what could have led to Mr. Aizawa doing that. Anyway, why aren't you heading home? Izuku asked, wiping away the trail of tears from his eyes. Momo seemed to be caught off guard. Oh, it's just my chauffeur hasn't arrived yet. You have a chauffeur? Izuku asked incredulously before he realized who he was talking to. Oh, you are a Yaoyorozu. Momo smiled hesitantly. I, I hope that does not inconvenience you. Izuku tilted his head to the side and looked at her questioningly. Huh? Inconvenience? He smiled brightly at her. No way. I don't have any problems with you. You are an interesting person, after all. Momo felt her face heat up and she averted her eyes quickly in embarrassment. T thank you. That means a lot to me. It's all right, Izuku said before he moved his eyes away from her. A peaceful silence descended between them which was broken by Momo who asked, What did the principal call you for? Suddenly, Izuku's demeanor changed. His eyes became icy and his face became expressionless. Momo could literally feel the anger radiating off of Izuku. I, I am sorry. I should not have asked, Momo apologized. A second later the atmosphere cooled down and Izuku's eye became warm again. He looked down at the ground and said, I am sorry. It's just, the meeting with the principal took a toll on me. No, no I should be the one saying sorry. I should not have pride. Izuku let out a chuckle. You really are a weird girl, Yaoyorozu. He then turned his head toward her. But why would you assume you being a Yaoyorozu would inconvenience me? Momo looked at her lap where her hands were curled up and were holding a fistful of her skirt. About that, I have heard that people don't like people from rich backgrounds. Izuku felt bad for the girl. 
He raised a hand and gently patted the girl's head. Don't worry about it. I am sure you are going to make good friends here. You are a nice girl. They are going to like you. Indeed, someone spoke from behind them. The two of them turned to notice Jeru, Kendo, Uraraka, and finally Iida walking toward them. They had three new students following them, too. One of them was a pink skinned, pink haired girl. The other one was a spiky, red haired boy. The last one was a short girl with dark green hair and weird walking posture. If we can befriend someone as unlikable as Green here, Jeru said with a playful smirk, we can easily befriend someone as sweet as you, Momo. Izuku made a grumbling noise while Momo giggled and smiled. Thank you, Kyoka, she said gratefully. Midoriya, Kendo called, gathering Izuku's attention. About the class, Ochako tried to speak. Izuku did not let them finish. He started laughing and said, Hey, hey. Don't worry about it, okay. I am fine. Jeru frowned and crossed her arms over her chest. Green, I think you need to stop trying to be strong. We are friends here, you know. Huh. Izuku looked at Jeru weirdly. Me trying to be strong? Don't put me in the same category as you. I am not weak. Jeru felt her eyebrow twitch at the taunt. But before she could retaliate, the red-haired newcomer spoke up. Hey, Midoriya. I just wanted to tell you I am sorry about what happened. Yeah. The pink skinned girl pitched in. You did not deserve that. If anyone deserved to be expelled, it was that little ball headed perverted bastard. Indeed, the dark haired girl said, looking at Izuku, you were a hundred times better than all of us. Izuku smiled genuinely at them. You guys don't have to apologize. You did not do any wrong, you know. We know, but still we feel bad, the pink haired girl said, looking downcast. But she brightened up and smiled excitedly. By the way, I am Mina Ishido and this here is, she snatched the red-haired boy by his neck and started drilling her fist into his head, playfully. This red-haired bastard is Ajiro Kirishima. And I am Suyu Asui, the dark green-haired girl introduced. Nice to meet you, Ashido, Kirishima, Asui, Izuku said with a smile. You can call me Su, Asui pitched in. In that case, call me Mina, or Mini, or Pinky. Anything you like. Izuku laughed awkwardly. Ahaha, uh -huh. I think I will stick to Asui and Ashido for now. Iida stepped forward and said, We tried to talk to Aizawa sensei about the expulsion. Well, let's just say. Aizawa sensei does not take to protests kindly. Izuku frowned, his eyebrows crinkling with disappointment. Why did you go groveling at his feet? Have some respect for yourself. Ochako scratched the back of her head. We just thought. If we raised our voices together, he would listen to us. And let me guess, Izuku said, his glasses sliding down his nose as he stared at her. He threatened to expel all of you, right? Kendo released a sigh and nodded. Yeah, he did. Izuku shook his head. You should have known something like this is going to happen, he said. But still, thanks for caring for me enough. Hey, we are all friends here, right? Momo said excitedly. We should all support each other. Damn right, girl, Jeru exclaimed happily. Suddenly, the sound of a phone beeping reached their ears. Momo began fishing into her pocket and pulled out her phone. Oh, my chauffeur is here, she said disappointedly. She put the phone back in her pocket and smiled at her new friends. I guess I will have to leave. She gave a small bow. Thank you for accepting me as your friend. Whoa, whoa. Calm down, girl. Mina shook her hands to and fro. Yeah. You should never bow to your friends, Ochako chimed in. They are right, Miss Yaoyorozu, Iida pitched in. Momo felt tears well up in her eyes. She had never thought that she would ever make friends. Yet, here she was surrounded by a group of people that were willing to call her friends. Thanks all of you, she whispered to herself. Momo turned around and was about to walk out of the main building of UA, but she stopped and looked back at Izuku. And Mr. Midoriya. Thank you for your words earlier. She smiled brightly. Izuku placed his hand behind his neck and smiled sheepishly. Nah, it's all right. Momo let out a giggle before walking out of the building. Izuku stared at her retreating back before he turned back to his other friends who were waggling their eyebrows at him while smiling teasingly. What? He yelled in embarrassment. As the group of friends left the main building, none of them realized that they were being spied on. The person spying on them was standing way far from their peripheral view. 
This person was none other than Shota Aizawa who was leaning against a pillar and watching the group of first years talking. He pushed himself off the pillar. Putting his hands in his pocket, he started walking toward the teacher's lounge with a slouched posture. Just when he thought he had reached his destination peacefully, he noticed All Might standing outside the door to the teacher's room. All Might noticed Aizawa approaching and gave his usual broad smile, Aizawa, there you are. Aizawa grumbled and looked at All Might in boredom. What can I do for you All Might? He asked. I heard that you expelled two students today, All Might said carefully. Aizawa shrugged his shoulders in an uncaring way, so? All Might's hands slipped from his hip. They were the two of the top three students apparently. Am I supposed to care about their rankings? Aizawa. They were the strongest in your class. One of them even broke my record in the entrance exam and the other has the potential to surpass even me. Aizawa looked at All Might in disapproval. A strong quirk does not make you a good hero, All Might. Just because you have a strong quirk and you turned out to be the best hero, does not mean everyone with a strong quirk would turn out like that. That Bakugo kid in Vlad's class. He is the prime example of a strong quirk not making a morally good person. He should be grateful that he is not in my class, otherwise I would have made sure he did not get admission in any other hero school. But still Aizawa, All Might tried to protest. You don't even know what they are capable of. They may. All Might, Aizawa interrupted before All Might could finish his sentence. If you see so much potential in them, then why don't you put your bet on them? If you believe in them so much, then wait and see what they do from here. Do they bounce back from this setback? Or do they give up and choose a different path? One of these choices will decide what kind of hero they will become, right, All Might? Aizawa walked past All Might toward the door to the teacher's lounge and he was about to open it when. Your morals are really twisted if you think making a good hero is to expel potential students on the very first day, All Might said lowly. The symbol of peace turned around and stared at Aizawa's back heatedly as he said, They are kids, Aizawa. We need to nurture them into perfect heroes. Not punish them for simple things. Your expulsion does not even make sense. Aizawa's hand was on the slit on the door when All Might had started speaking. His hand dropped. Kids, huh, he muttered in a low voice. Quite the privileged kids, won't you say, All Might? But then again, you won't understand anyway. What do you mean? All Might asked in shock. Aizawa turned his head upward and stared at the ceiling. You are super strong, aren't you All Might? Aizawa asked but this time, instead of his stoic voice, there was a hint of melancholy in it. All that strength must be useful when it comes to saving people. No wait. You have already saved countless people. That must be nice. All Might stared at Aizawa's back in confusion. What are you trying to get it, Aizawa? Aizawa let out a hollow chuckle. You are so above in power and stature that you often forget the cruelty that occurs at the roots of the pillar that you have created. You are so high up in the pedestal that what happens in the base is invisible to you. Aizawa turned his head to the side and stared at All Might through the corner of his eyes. You say that my morals are twisted. You were right. Because the things I have witnessed during my time as a hero, you will never see them in your life. All Might could only watch speechlessly as Aizawa opened the door to the teacher's lounge and entered the room. He knew that Aizawa was a reserved man and when it came to hero duty, the man took it seriously. But what could Aizawa have seen that had caused such a reaction from the man? Even though Aizawa kept it well hidden, All Might did not miss the guilt that he had seen in those dry eyes. With all that thought in mind, All Might decided to leave and ponder. Inside the teacher's lounge, the moment Aizawa had entered the room and closed the door behind him, a loud voice attacked his ears. What the hell were you thinking? Aizawa sighed and deadpanned at Hazashi who was fuming and glaring at him. What? You not only expelled the number two son but also expelled the student who was the top scorer in the entrance exam. Are you out of your mind? He is right you know, a female voice said. Aizawa stared past Hazashi and saw Nomori sitting on his desk with her legs crossed. She had changed her attire which now consisted of a tight flesh-colored bodysuit over which she wore a black-colored breastless leotard. A weird choice of hero clothing for sure. You just expelled two of your strongest and best students, Namori said, looking at Aizawa with narrowed eyes. Do you want to go the Nezu route? Get yourself kicked out of UA as well? Shota walked past Hazashi and toward his desk. He shrugged his shoulder and said, What is the worst they can do? Fire me from my job. That will be helpful for me and I can focus on my hero duties. Namori frowned in disappointment. 
Is this how you want to honor the last wishes of your friend? Shota's eyes steeled, and he glared at Namori heatedly. Do not bring him in this. Then stop making wrong decisions, Hazashi exclaimed in frustration. Shota ignored the two of them and focused on getting his desk clean before he left. Nimori sighed and addressed Shota. You will not change your mind, huh? I hope you remember Todoroki as Endeavor's son and Midoriya's mother as an influential model. Both of them have enough pull to humiliate you in public. Shota focused on arranging the books on his desk. You guys are overreacting. Neither the principal nor I expelled them from UA just demoted them to general studies. If they have potential, they will be back in the hero course in four months. Namori hopped down at Shota's desk. I hope you know what you were doing, she said and walked out without glancing back a second time. Hazashi looked at Shota sadly. This is because of that incident, isn't it? What are you talking about? Shota asked, without looking up from his desk. That night. At the hospital, Hazashi. Shota interrupted, pausing where he was. I think you should leave. Hazashi did not protest. He just gave Shota a melancholic look and walked out of the room. Shota did not know how long he stood there motionless, but the images of that night were flashing through his eyes. The blood, the gory scene, was etched in his mind forever. He squeezed his eyes tightly and pinched them with his fingers. He took a deep breath. He needed to go home and have a drink. Suddenly there was a knock on the door, causing Aizawa to sigh. Why did everyone have to come today and question him? Aizawa raised his eyes to the door and saw the number two hero standing there intimidatingly. May I come in? Endeavor said. Sure. Endeavor walked to Aizawa's desk. Grabbing a chair from a table nearby, Endeavor spun in the air before placing it in his preferable position. He sat down, crossed his arms over his chest, and stared at Aizawa. I heard you expelled my son. Aizawa nodded fearlessly. I did, he answered to the statement. Let's talk about that, shall we? Aizawa looked at Endeavor inquiringly, and a few moments later shrugged and said, Sure. Mom. I am home. Izuku closed the door behind him as he walked tiredly through the hallway and into the dining room. Welcome home, Izu Chan, his mother's voice reached his ears. He could hear his mother working in the kitchen. His heart ached with pain. He walked into the dining room and let his bag drop near the couch, where he plopped down tiredly. What am I going to tell mom? He muttered to himself and ran a hand through his hair. His mother had been the greatest support in his life. She had been there with him during his difficulties. She was there every night consoling him when he would cry for his quirk to come. She was there, taking his care when each night his body would ache from training. She was there when he was mentally exhausted from studying. She was there to cheer him on at every difficult step of his life. How was he going to tell this person that he had gotten expelled from the hero course on the very first day? Izuku knew that it was not his fault that he had been expelled. He had no idea why Aizawa would do something like that. He had laughed through it all after all. The only thing that he could not laugh off was his mother's feeling from this ordeal. Oh, Izuku was fully aware that his mother would never scold him or anything. He was 99% sure that she would smile and support him like always. But that was the worst part of it. She would keep all the disappointment and hurt buried within herself and would never express her feelings to him. It was this fact that pained Izuku more than anything. Soon his mother entered the room with a smile. How was your day, dear? She asked but immediately noticed something was wrong. Izuku looked way too sad and defeated. It was as if she had returned to that time when Izuku had not awakened his quirk. The images of a tired and defeated child flashed through her eyes. Inko walked up to Izuku and laid a gentle hand on his shoulder. A hand that only a mother could provide. Izuku, is everything all right? It, Izuku tried to form words but his mouth failed him. He did not know what to say. I just don't feel well, Izuku finally said. Inko stared at Izuku in worry. Why? Did something happen at school? Yeah. Did a girl reject you or something? Inko joked trying to lighten the mood. Izuku let out a chuckle and said, I hope it were that simple. Inko squatted down to Izuku's eye level. Izuku, you trust me don't you? Izuku nodded without any hesitation. Then please tell me what's wrong, Izu-chan. Izuku averted his eyes from his mother's and whispered, I was expelled. I am sorry, I got expelled. Oh, the two of them sat in silence for a few moments before Inko asked, why? Izuku did not look her in the eye but stared at the floor. I don't know. 
Suddenly, Aizawa's words ran through his ears. Do you know why I expelled you, Midoriya? No, sir. Tell me Midoriya. What do you think it is that makes someone a hero? Um, their ability to save people, hum. Typical, but a good answer nonetheless. Aizawa paused for a brief moment before saying, Ponder on that question. If you decide to stay, I will come to you for an answer when I think you're ready. Aizawa said something that made no sense to me, Izuku said with a frown. Oh. What did he say? Not say exactly. More like he asked me a question. All right. Go on, tell me. What makes a person a hero? I see. Inko took Izuku's hand and gave it a gentle squeeze. And what did you answer, Izu chan? Their ability to save people. That is a good answer. What did Aizawa say? That is the thing. He asked me to ponder on the question and that he will come for an answer when he thinks I am ready. I see. Do you think you have an answer? Hum. Inko hummed in thought before answering, for me, a hero is someone who does not back down no matter what. Every time he is thrown down, he jumps back and continues to fight. For me, that is what makes a hero. So, basically the ability to fight continuously, great endurance? Inko let out a giggle. Something like that. But I think the answer to that question varies from person to person. Izuku frowned in irritation. I know that. That is what is making me more confused. Does Aizawa expect me to find an answer that matches his description of a hero? How am I even going to do that? I am quite sure you are going to find an answer to that. You have always managed to find an answer to problems. Izuku released a sigh and ran a hand through his hair. Well, the easiest way out is to change schools. What? Izuku shrugged his shoulders. Well, yeah. I mean no one will reject a student who beat All Might's record in the UA entrance exam. And I also have the president backing me up. So, I am sure I can get admission to another hero academy. Suddenly, Izuku felt two hands slap both of his cheeks, causing him to close his eyes. When he opened them, he saw Inko staring fiercely at him. She was holding his face with both of her hands. Izuku Midoriya. Inko firmly began. I did not give birth to a coward. You were never someone who would run away from problems, Izuku. You have always faced problems head on. So, why are you running now? UA is your dream academy. Why are you running from your dream? Just because you met a hurdle so early. Is that it? Is my son, the next strongest hero, going to run away from his dream because someone thought he did not belong in the hero course? Answer me Izuku. Izuku's gaze shifted down and he stared at his palms. His mother was right. When had he started questioning himself? Why was he even questioning himself? Perhaps it was because his idol of all people had expelled him. But that was no reason to act like this. He was Izuku Midoriya. Not a coward. Izuku, Inko's voice was stern and confident. What are you going to do? Izuku raised his eyes and met Inko's with newfound determination. You're right. I can't run away from this. I am going to prove to Aizawa that I have what it takes to be a hero. And I am going to find the answer to his question. Inko whooped her hands in the air and cheered. Yes. That's my Izu chan. She threw her hands around his neck and pulled him into a tight hug. I knew you were going to fight instead of running away. Just think about it. The first arc of your biopic will begin with you fighting for justice for yourself. Izuku's face lit up into a genuine smile as he hugged his mother. I don't know what I am going to do without you. Suddenly, Izuku's phone rang. Inko let Izuku out of the hug as the green-haired boy pulled out his phone from his pocket. Damn. Izuku whistled, impressed. I knew she has eyes everywhere, but this is fast. Is it the president? Inko asked. Yep. The president of the Hero Public Safety Commission was a prestigious and powerful position. But the bane of such positions was always one thing. Paperwork. There was even a law called the Paperwork Law that stated that paperwork doubled every one hour and would triple if left undone. But that was not the focus right now. The president was reading a very interesting report right now. And if what the report said was true, then it was going to be a boon for the Hero Society. The report pointed out a few things that could help to make the Hero Society a lot more flourishing and safer. It was a long process, but the end results made the wait worth it. Suddenly, the sound of the door flying opening reached her ears. In a quick maneuver, the president pulled out a sharp knife from under her desk and hurled it at whoever was entering through the door. The hell you psycho old woman. A young and very familiar voice yelled from the doorway. Are you trying to kill me or something? 
she finally focused and saw Izuku standing at the doorway with the knife floating inches away from his face. She shot up from her chair, her hands banging against the wood of her desk. Then knock first you massive dolt. Who the hell enters a confidential room without knocking? The president yelled. From beyond the doorway, the assistant of the president could only laugh. The usually calm and collected president of HPSC would always lose her control when Izuku was nearby. It was as if Izuku's real quirk was irritating the president. Inside the room, the president had calmed down and sat back on her seat. Come in, she said. Izuku let the knife fall to his hands and walked up to the desk. Placing the knife on the table, he took a chair opposite to the president and leaned back to relax. So, I heard that you got yourself expelled, the president began. Izuku shrugged his shoulders nonchalantly. Yeah, I guess I did. The president raised an eyebrow at the carefree attitude. I expected a more disheartened attitude. Izuku smirked looking at the president. Come on old lady, are you telling me you don't like me smiling? The president gave Izuku a flat look and said, it's nothing like that. It is weird to see someone so happy after they got expelled from their dream course. Izuku laughed a bit. I know, right? But I guess you will have to thank my mother for that. And not to mention, I look better when smiling and smirking, don't I? The president ignored the snarky question. What are you going to do now? If you want, I can arrange for you to get admission in some other. Hey, 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 old lady. Stop right there, Izuku interrupted. The president raised an eyebrow but did not say anything. You really think, I, Izuku Midoriya, am going to run away from this war? No way. I am going to stay here and prove my shit to that bastard principal and Aizawa. The president suppressed a smirk from appearing on her face. Oh, is that so? So, you're not going to leave the school. Nah. Where's the fun in that? I am going to do something even better. And that something is, Izuku smirked again. Sports festival. This time, even the president let a smirk appear on her face. Go on. The best way to deal with this is to prove to everyone just how strong I am and reclaim my place in the hero course again. And I won't lie. I am feeling a little vindictive. So, what better way than do it during a public event like the sports festival? Not only will I prove my strength but I will be able to humiliate Aizawa by defeating his class. What say? You like it. The president leaned back in her chair and crossed her arms over her chest. She looked at Izuku and smiled proudly. It seems we have trained you well, Izuku. And when were you going to tell me that he was the principal? Eh? Someday I guess. Fuck you, Prez. Get out, already. Next day, Izuku and Iida were on a train to Musutafu. Izuku was sitting pretty much motionlessly throughout the train journey and Iida was starting to get worried. Izuku had a tendency to talk continuously, especially when bored. But for Izuku to stay quiet throughout the journey was shocking. Izuku, are you alright? Izuku turned his face toward his friend and looked at him questioningly. Huh? Why won't I be alright? You were quiet. You were never so silent. Izuku let out a laugh. Oh, come on. I just have a few things going on in my mind. Iida frowned. That just means you are not alright. Eh? Hey. Guess we have different ideas about not being alright. The speakers announced that they had reached their destination station. They got off the train as soon as it came to a halt. The two of them walked out of the station and into the street. There was a peaceful silence between them until Iida stopped in his tracks. Midoriya. Izuku also stopped in his way and looked back at Iida. What is it? What did the principal say? Izuku sighed and looked at the morning sky. Just something I had never expected to hear. He did say he does not want to expel me from UA and has demoted me to the general course. He says that if I want to prove my worth, I can do that during the sports festival. What are you going to do? Izuku lowered his eyes and saw the worry on Ida's face. Walking close to him, Izuku placed a fist on Ida's heart and smiled. Hey! We promised that we will become the greatest heroes from UA, right? So let's do that, best friend. Iida felt the corners of his lips rise up in a smile as he too placed his fist on Izuku's heart. Yes, let's do that, best friend. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.